Uh, so let me go back to the Zoom window. Of course, it, the, 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 the nomenclature of this is, is slightly confusing because it says share screen and it's not sharing screen at all, it's sharing a window. <laughs> uh, oh, so someone's pointed out that they've seen live feeds that go on for several hours. I think it must have been just a um, the, the reason it cut off. I don't know why it was. Uh, it seems to be. I think it's going out live again now. Um, okay. So that's okay. good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, we've got three minutes to go, and number of participants is building up. Hi, everybody. Um, I hope you had a, a nice lunch break and. We will be resuming in a couple of minutes with Lee Fretcher from the University of Leicester. We managed to bag Lee before the Federation of Astronomical Societies did, which was good for us, but unfortunate for them because <laughs> the FAS, the Federation of Astronomical Societies, are actually having a convention in Leicester and Lee is uh, at the University of Leicester. So that would have been just a short trip for him but it's an even shorter trip as it happens because he can he's broadcasting here from the clouds of jupiter which yes. is where he lives most of the time but i'm in my home office here uh, today which is uh, not always got the jovian skies as a, as a backdrop but i thought that was better than you seeing the insides of my uh, rather cluttered office on the top floor of where i live right but it certainly is easier coming here than it is to drive over to space center which is about half an hour away from me all right in okay and I see the title of your talk is Observing Giants Pro-Am Collaborations. And that mm. sounds really interesting because people always talk about pro-am collaborations, but I'm <clears throat> it's the, the actual number of amateurs who actually do bite the bullet and get involved in professional level ex, uh, work is, is comparatively limited, I think. But there are many good planetary observers around and to feel that their observations can be of use is is really good. And I remember that the um, the last major storm on Saturn, I think it was, was actually spotted by an amateur first, even though Cassini was orbiting and sending back images, but it just happened to be on, it was in a long orbit, wasn't it? And just happened to be on the wrong side of, of Saturn at the time yeah. that the storm That's broke right. out. So you, the amateurs... Got a, got a still got a part to play i think as they did of course during the early part of the uh, well the, during the 19th and early 20th centuries when virtually no professionals were interested in the planets at all but since the space age it's become a different matter hasn't it and the advent of so many so much new instrumentation that means that it's now we can now see the we know now a huge amount about the outer planets i remember when i was um in my teens, there was a, a project to, there, there were no pictures in the books of the planet Uranus, just um, just artist impressions of what it might look like, a huge blue, uh, a green billiard ball, basically. And um, there was a project called Stratoscope 2 to send up a balloon to observe from above the atmosphere the uh, an image of Uranus. And I don't think it came up with any decent results because Uranus was a notoriously difficult planet to image from ground level or photographs were, were useless in those days. Uh, visual observations were a lot better. Uh, you could catch that moment of good seeing. And yeah, Uranus was a particularly difficult one. I've been for another project I've been working on recently. I was going back through some uh, visual records where people had been sketching what they were seeing through their eyepiece and um, faint hints of dusky bands on uh, the surface of Uranus that um, people were suggesting. But because we now know the orbit of Uranus very precisely, we know when the poles are facing you versus when it's uh, near equinox and the two poles can be visible. Uh, we can kind of reconstruct whether what those amateur astronomers back in the early 20th century, late 19th century, whether they could have been able to see any of the bands and the belts and zones that we know are present today. And in some cases, it's quite compelling. But in others, you see sketches of bands across Uranus, which simply, they're implausible. We couldn't actually have uh, ever seen that particular vantage point. So uh, it really did remain um, out of scope for a lot of people until the Voyager spacecraft came along in the, in the 80s and revealed Uranus and Neptune to us. Uh, in all their glory but certainly visual amateur astronomy was an immense challenge uh, for people at that point well the fact that the 
position of the pole of Uranus and the inclination of Uranus's um, actual rotation, uh, actual tilt was, was known way back in the 19th century, suggests to me anyway that markings were visible on, on Uranus, otherwise no one would have known. And I have actually seen, uh, using the 24-inch refractor at Mill Hill Observatory long, long ago, I, I did see very fleeting markings on, on Uranus, and Martin was showing us the pictures that he has he has made. So it is definitely possible to observe these effect these uh, the markings visually, but as we know, visual observations aren't as anything like as reliable as as, as modern imaging. So it was a uh, right at the limit of visibility. Anyway, um, I better let you get on because we're talking about observing giants pro um, collaboration. So I'd like to introduce. Uh, we've got lots of participants eager to hear what you've got to say, and we're now on YouTube as well. So over to you, Lee. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Robin, and thanks for the invitation uh, today. So I, I'm a planetary scientist based at the University of Leicester, and the specialism that I have is looking at the atmospheres of uh, the giant planets of our solar system and trying to understand how the meteorological patterns, the chemistry and the dynamics of those atmospheres uh, relate back to our home planet trying to place the Earth's um, climate and weather systems into a much broader context by looking at the giant planets uh, of our solar system as well. Now, when I was um, trying to put this talk together, I was trying to decide how best to um, uh, organise all of the content that I'd like to show to you today. And one, I th one thing I think that um, is going to be of particular interest to those in, in Pop Astro is that Jupiter and Saturn in particular are perhaps the best targets for professional and amateur collaborations out of all of the uh, various objects that you can see in the night sky. And that is because Jupiter and Saturn, and to a lesser extent Uranus and Neptune, are changing so much over a range of timescales. Meteorology can act over the course of just a few short hours, uh, as well as going to the scales of storm systems that persist for months and even years. And try as hard as we like, professional astronomers are just not able to get the time on world-class ground-based facilities or even things like the Hubble Space Telescope in order to track the evolution of those features. So when you're trying to study something where you need to understand the time scales involved, that regular sampling then comes from the amateur community. And it's possible that there are some people listening along uh, today who are very familiar with this, but I'd like to try to make the case that a lot of the discoveries that we've been making about what makes these atmospheres tick are coming from collaborations between professionals and amateur observers and hopefully inspire some people uh, to try to get involved. So uh, without further ado, let's go to the uh, first slide to give you an idea of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I'll give you a high level idea as to why we might be interested in studying the four giant planets. Then I'll talk about what we're able to detect from these giant planets if we look not just in visible light, but at shorter wavelengths in the ultraviolet and also longer wavelengths out into the infrared and microwave. So using that then as our toolkit, I'll start to describe uh, what we know about the giant planets today, what I've called the anatomy of the giants here, uh, talking about the storm systems, the chemistry and the physics that's driving what you can see if you were to look through a telescope at these objects. And then we'll finish and wrap up by looking at the, uh, the future of exploration of the four giant planets. So without further ado, let's look at some of the motivations. So these four giant planets without a, a surface to get in the way of the pure fluid dynamical uh, flows of these atmospheres are a geophysical wonderland for us because what you see in terms of the meteorology and climate of the giants is hypothetically what you would see if you were to take away all of the complicating influences in the climate system here on Earth. So take away the interaction between the sea surface and the atmosphere, take away the presence of continents and valleys and mountain ranges that get in the way of those, those fluid flows, and then just observe how the clouds are being redistributed uh, by those fluid dynamical uh, processes. And so the banded structure that is common to all four of the giant planets is actually not so dissimilar 
from the rather more loose bands that we see in the Earth's atmosphere. And some of you may be familiar with the Hadley circulations in the tropics, the feral circulations at mid latitudes, and then the polar circulations up at high latitudes. So Earth has three bands, if you like, where something like Jupiter might have eight bands in each hemisphere. Now, in addition, when the planets formed in the first place, these um, in, enormous gravitational wells that the, the four giant planets represent means that they um, have forever retained the building blocks that went into forming those planets in the first place. So if you like, they are time capsule for the composition of the protosolar nebula at the time when these uh, four planets were forming. So if you're able to compare the composition from Jupiter to Saturn to Uranus to Neptune, it gives you some way of looking back four and a half billion years ago on what the composition of the protosolar nebula was like. Now these giant planets are also fascinating targets because they're not alone. They're orbited by a collection of icy and rocky satellites, some of which may contain what we call habitable environments. That is environments that appear to have liquid water uh, dominating their structure and potentially all the sources of energy and nutrients that you need in order for something to be classed uh, as habitable. Not that there's life there, but it could be habitable um, compared to some of the other more harsh environments we see through the solar system. And finally, these four giant worlds that we have in our backyard, if you like, are the perfect templates for understanding the uh, pantheon of giant planets that we're now discovering around other stars in our galaxy. So the physics, the chemistry, the processes that work on our four giants could be of use if we look uh, further out into the uh, distant galaxy. And of course, the benefit of having them close to us is that we can send robotic spacecraft out to explore them, which is something I'll talk about in the next few slides. Now, we talk about the giant planets as a collection, but really they're two classes of astrophysical objects, Jupiter and Saturn being the gas giant planets, and then Uranus and Neptune being the ice giants. The gas giants are primarily made of hydrogen and helium. And what you're seeing when you look through a telescope in visible light are photons being scattered from clouds of ammonia ice. So it gets cold enough for ammonia gas to condense to form the topmost clouds. And then those clouds are um, contaminated by various chemical impurities, which give it the range of spectacular colours that you can see. So we believe that these formed relatively quickly in the solar system. We're able to collect in all of that nebula, hydrogen and helium before they, the rest of it was blasted away by the sun going into one of the later stages of its evolution. And because there's so much hydrogen, that means that as you get down to the crushing temperatures and pressures down in their cores, that hydrogen can actually be squeezed together to such an extent that the electrons and protons become separated and you effectively have a, a sea of metallic hydrogen down um, several thousand kilometers down below those cloud tops, but then really dominating the gravitational magnetic field of those two worlds. Now that's in contrast to the ice giants Uranus and Neptune. They're called ice giants not because they're made predominantly of ice, but because maybe they collected in more of these icy materials than they did hydrogen and helium when they were first forming. So the ratio of these heavier materials compared to hydrogen and helium is much larger on the ice giants than it is on the gas giants. In fact, it gets so cold on the ice giants that we get the formation of clouds of uh, methane and hydrogen sulfide rather than the ammonia clouds of Jupiter. And we think that their smaller size is telling us something about their history. Maybe they formed slightly more slowly than the gas giants, meaning that they weren't able to collect as much hydrogen and helium to form the bigger gas giants that we see in Jupiter and Saturn. So the absence of that additional hydrogen and helium means that you don't get the metallic hydrogen down at depth, but all of that water that may be present within those two worlds can form this bizarre icy mantle, something we call super ionic water ice down at great depths within the interior. So we really do have two different types of giant worlds here in our solar system. And that's useful when we start to look out at extrasolar planets, because extrasolar planets, if you just look at the census of uh, planetary radii that you see here on the uh, screen on the right hand side, you can see that the 
bulk of the planets that we've been detecting so far are intermediate between the terrestrial world on the left hand side and the ice giants at about four Earth radii in the center of that diagram. And these are known as super Earths or sub Neptunes, those two peaks that you can see in the chart. And so if the sub Neptunes, for example, are really gas giants or icy giants in the same way as those that we see in our solar system, then maybe they're governed by the same fluid dynamical flows, uh, shifts in uh, seasonal climates. Um, maybe they're attended by large, potentially habitable satellites in the same way. So the four giant planet systems that we have could be our best and closest representatives of something that appears to be the most common outcome of the entire planet formation process. Now, with all of that in mind, we've had several decades now of exploring these distant worlds. And don't forget that even today, the timescales involved in getting to somewhere like Jupiter, even with the fastest uh, mission we've sent so far, the Juno spacecraft, is still a five year duration to get from Earth out to distant Jupiter. So back in the 80s, we had the Voyager spacecraft, which really for Uranus and Neptune in particular, it took them from being wandering points of distant light and really allowed us to start resolving uh, what was going on within their their atmospheres. In the 90s, we then had the Galileo mission launched by the Space Shuttle. Uh, this was followed in the 2000s by the Cassini spacecraft, which had 13 years of incredible orbital exploration of Saturn. Today, we're working with the Juno spacecraft that's still in orbit around Jupiter. More on that later on, but here at the University of Leicester, we're official co-investigators on that particular mission. And we're also looking ahead to the next big mission, the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer in the 2020s. More on that at the end of this, this presentation. And if my personal dream is that in the next uh, 10 to 15 years or so, we'll really see a new mission destined for lonely Uranus and Neptune, only visited once by the Voyager spacecraft. But let's come back to Jupiter for just a little bit first. Now, the Galileo spacecraft did do some fantastic science in orbit around Jupiter and, of course, had the Galileo probe that plunged down into the cloud tops of Jupiter back in 1995. But the challenges it had in terms of its um, uh, antenna, which didn't unfold properly, its solid state recorder, which had a few issues, it meant that we didn't get the amount of data back that we really wanted to from the Galileo mission. That meant that uh, exploration of Jupiter really was sort of unfinished business, if you like. And that led to the development then of the Juno spacecraft, the Juno mission to Jupiter, which was going um, to try to explore deeper down into Jupiter than there was ever possible before. A lot of the work we'd been doing up until um, Juno arrived was really only sensing from where you can see the cloud tops up into the higher atmosphere and out into its um, magnetospheric environment. And what we wanted to know was what was going on deeper down below those clouds. What were the fundamental uh, forces and chemistry, thermochemistry and photochemistry that was shaping the atmosphere deeper down inside. And in order to do that, you need various uh, mechanisms or techniques to peer down below the clouds to deeper levels than you can before. Juno really has three that uh, are particularly important. The first is to measure the magnetic field of Jupiter, which again we think is being formed down in those uh, metallic hydrogen uh, layers down at depth. The second is to measure very precisely the gravitational field, which it does by uh, listening to the radio signal from Juno as it comes close to the giant planet and Juno is being tugged and pulled and moved just slightly by the uh, mass anomalies within Jupiter itself and that by measuring that we're able to reconstruct what the distribution of material is within uh, the, the insides of Jupiter. And then the third technique is to use microwave light to peer down through uh, the cloud tops. The clouds are transparent in microwave light, giving us another handle uh, to look deep. So Juno launched in 2011. It flew out to the Jovian system arriving in 2016. It had a mission that was only designed to last for a few years. We were worried about the radiation environment degrading the, um, the equipment on board. But actually the way it's worked out is that the instruments themselves all still work in, in very good health. And that means that uh, Juno can continue. You know, once you've got an asset out there in the system doing great science, it would be foolish to uh, step away from it. And just this summer, we've actually transitioned from being in the prime mission phase 
36 orbits around Jupiter, we've now moved into the extended mission phase. So Juno will hopefully carry on until at least 2025. Um, and its orbit is evolving, as you can see here. Now, Juno flies on a polar orbit and that means that it spends a lot of its time out quite distance from Jupiter and then just over the course of just a few hours it comes really really close into the giant planet screaming from the north pole across the equator and then exit exiting out over the south pole and getting really high resolution close-up views of Jupiter's atmosphere while it's doing so so it means that a lot of the work we do is um, focused on these perijove close encounters once every 53 days Days or so. Okay, so let's shift gears a little bit now and talk about what we can do by use, uh, using multiple different wavelengths of light to look at the Jovian atmosphere. And this um, also applies to the other three giants as well. Jupiter is just the, the logical choice to, to get us started. So we talked a bit about Juno just there, and Juno has uh, something called JunoCam on board, which is actually a public engagement camera. It was never on there to do science. There were no mission level scientific requirements to have a visible camera, but of course, common sense prevails and you wouldn't fly all the way out to an object as glorious as Jupiter and not take a visible camera with you. And in fact, that's paying off immensely. So this um, montage of uh, images that were put together by Gerald Eichstadt and Sean Duran using publicly available data from JunoCam shows what the view was like from this spacecraft as it went over the North Pole, which you can see in dark blue, then across the equator, which you can see on the, the top right hand side, and then exited out over the South Pole, which you can see on the bottom row just there. And glorious images like this have been collected on every single one of the Perijove passes. And it goes straight online on the Mission Juno website, which means that talented uh, image processors, amateur astronomers, computer software designers can go in and play with these data and come up with some incredible, uh, really beautiful creations from the Juno data itself. For example, here's another one of Sean's uh, montages, which I absolutely love, showing the, the southern hemisphere of Jupiter with those white anticyclones in a ring uh, embedded within one of the darker brown belts just there. But some of the close up views that uh, we've been able to see of swirling anticyclonic systems, of interacting storm systems that look like uh, when you pour your cream into the top of your cup of coffee and give it a stir, those tendrils of white material are uh, individual storms being stretched out and redistributed by the atmospheric flows that are present just there. And in some cases, such as this um, this particular storm in the southern hemisphere is known as the spectre. And you can almost see the shock waves in the atmosphere as the air is flowing uh, in a clockwise sense around that, um, that feature down there in the southern hemisphere. These views will keep um, fluid dynamicists and planetary scientists going for quite some time into the future, trying to understand the chaotic environment that they're seeing here. But what I'm trying to uh, point out is that although these visible images are spectacular, we learn a lot more by extending uh, the range of wavelengths that we can actually use. So on this slide, what I've done is I've pulled together some different views of Jupiter across multiple different wavelengths to give you a flavor for the sorts of science that we can do, uh, observing not just with a spacecraft, but also with ground-based facilities. So the two on the top left are actually Hubble images. So they are taken uh, from space in the ultraviolet, which is sensitive to the absorption of aerosols high up in Jupiter's atmosphere, to the visible, which really gives you a sense of the, uh, the coloring agents that are present within those clouds. As we move then into the near infrared at two microns, those different bands are telling you something about how high up the various cloud features extend. So where you see whiter, higher, features there that you do at the equator and over some of the little spots and also over the north and south poles. What that's telling you is that there are aerosols high up within the atmosphere, the uh, reflecting light in the near infrared. Then at some wavelengths, at three to four microns in particular, we actually have quite a, um, a, an atmosphere where the gas is absorbing most of the light, but we can then see the very delicate fine emission from the northern and southern aurora of Jupiter as uh, um, particles are being funneled in over the northern and southern poles and interacting with the hydrogen atmosphere to create the glow that we see at three to four microns. 
go just a little bit further out to five microns and you get to a, a wavelength that actually sounds relatively deep into the cloud forming layer of Jupiter. What you see here is um, clouds in silhouette against a darker, brighter background. So where you see dark, that's because the clouds are absorbing light. Where you see bright, that's because the clouds are not present and so the light can get straight through. And this particular wavelength is one of my favorites because we can see some of the incredible dynamics that are going on down in the cloud forming region. Completely opposite to that is the next image at seven microns, which is sensitive to methane that is uh, emitting light high up in the stratosphere. So several hundred kilometers above those cloud decks, we have a stratosphere where the key process that's governing the physics there is the absorption of sunlight and the re-radiation of sunlight back into space. And you can see it looks very, very different from what it does down in the cloud tops. It look, you can see wave patterns in the northern hemisphere. You can see faint hints of bright, uh, bright warm uh, belts and cooler zones in those pictures as well and so on and so forth. You can go through the various wavelengths of the in electromagnetic spectrum to, to really treat Jupiter like an onion, peeling back the different layers of an onion to try to figure out what's driving the atmosphere at depth versus what's driving the atmosphere higher up. And then finally, how is that atmosphere interacting with the magnetic field that surrounds them? Now, as a planetary scientist, we don't just use images. The main workhorse for what I do is to use spectroscopy. And this is a slightly busy diagram, so I don't need you to take away uh, all of the details on here. But I just want to point out that on the left-hand side are two um, spectra taken in reflected sunlight. The top left is visible, the bottom left is near infrared. And if you had a perfect uh, sort of snooker ball planet with no absorption, no ga gases doing any absorption, you would be basically treating it like a mirror, reflecting back the spectrum of the sun. Where you see these big cutouts in the spectrum, that's due to gases within that atmosphere absorbing, uh, absorbing light at different wavelengths. So for example, when you are looking at Jupiter in visible light, and maybe you're placing a red, green, blue filter, maybe you've got some narrow ones that are sensitive to atmospheric methane, that then allows you to do the same onion peeling that we were doing with the broader electromagnetic spectrum on a slightly uh, smaller scale. But seeing, for example, if you place a filter right in the heart of one of those methane bands, you'll be sounding aerosols high up in the atmosphere, whereas you put a filter that's just sampling the continuum between the different methane absorptions that allows you to sound deeper down into the atmosphere. Then the two plots on the right hand side are showing uh, light being emitted, thermal light uh, from both the hydrogen helium and also various gases that are present just there. So we are able to construct spectra from a variety of different instruments. And when we model those spectra using computer software to try to understand how the light is interacting with the various gaseous species, we're able to then create a three dimensional picture of what a giant planet atmosphere looks like. Having said that we use primarily spectroscopy, we're all human, and when we look at the images themselves, we really get a kick out of them. This is probably the state of the art for the infrared imaging that we're doing at the University of Leicester. And our, our workhorse for this these days is the very large telescope down in Chile, which I had the privilege to go and visit a couple of years ago before the COVID pandemic struck, and I got to work in those uh, facilities you can see in the, uh, the top of your screen, acquiring data sets of this sort of quality. So these are telling us about the temperatures, about the gases, and about the aerosols that are present within these giant planet atmospheres. Okay, so having described the toolkit that we use for doing the observations and how we create a three-dimensional three view of the Jovian atmosphere using the different wavelengths of light, let's now give a sort of high-level introduction to what a giant planet looks like in terms of vertical structure and uh, horizontal structure. We know that all four of the giants are effectively time capsules for the material that went into them during the uh, 
planet formation process. And as you might expect, they're made of the most common elements that are present in the universe, hydrogen, helium, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and to a lesser extent, phosphorus as well. And because there's so much hydrogen, all of these molecules are present in their reduced or hydrogenated forms. Okay, that means they're combined with hydrogen. So carbon becomes methane, nitrogen becomes ammonia, sulfur becomes hydrogen sulfide, and oxygen becomes water. Now those molecules then will condense at different temperatures within the atmosphere. And if you get really, really, really cold, down at the sort of uh, 80 to 90 Kelvin level, you'll be cold enough for methane to condense. And that's what's happening on the ice giants to form the, the whiter clouds that you see through a telescope on the ice giants. Jupiter and Saturn are both too warm in their atmospheres for methane to condense. And so what you get there is methane in a purely gaseous form. However, both ammonia, hydrogen, sulfide and water condense to form clouds. And when you condense to form clouds, you can do funky things to the temperature profile. You basically the latent heat of condensation provides energy to the environment, which can then supercharge the, uh, the flows that we're seeing and form uh, spectacular spectacular lightning strikes, for example, that you can see in this um, artist impression of what might be happening in a giant planet atmosphere. So those um, volatiles, which are made up of the key elements that form Jupiter and the giant planets, condense to form clouds. It's the clouds that mostly we're looking at through a telescope. It doesn't have to just form clouds. That methane on uh, Jupiter and Saturn that's hanging around uh, can also be photolyzed by ultraviolet light from the sun. The UV rays come in, they split the methane molecule apart. And when they do that, the radicals that are left over can recombine in a whole range of different ways to form hydrocarbons, photochemically produced hydrocarbons, some of which then go on to condense. Some of them may sediment or sink downwards and form what we call the cloud condensation nuclei, the, the little grains around which the condensation of the volatiles must act. And this one of the suggestions for what's forming the beautiful colors of Jupiter is that some of these photochemicals are adding sort of impurities to the uh, pure condensate. Ammonia ice would normally just appear pure white as we see in the zones in the background just there, but maybe these other chemicals are contaminating that somehow. In addition, we also have stuff flowing in from inside. Um, constant bombardment by micrometeorites, by dust that's raining in on the environment, by the occasional comet or asteroid that comes in and strikes Jupiter. These are delivering oxygenated species like water, carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide to the upper atmosphere. We can detect those uh, using various different, um, usually submillimeter observations of the giant planets. And finally, in addition to the things that are condensing to form volatiles, there are some species which are perfect tracers of the fluid dynamical flows, like again, putting cream into your coffee and watching as it swirls around as you stir the cup. Things like phosphine, carbon monoxide, and something called power hydrogen, which is just a different flavor of hydrogen gas. We can use those to trace the dynamics of the atmosphere. So when we look at all of these different species, we can start to construct a vertical picture of what Jupiter or any of the giant planets looks like. And again, we have the condensation of the cloud decks into multiple layers, uh, sort of a, like a layered cake as you probe down into the, the deeper and deeper atmosphere. And broadly speaking, we have um, various different layers on top of each other that are not dissimilar from what we know of the Earth's atmosphere. So we have a troposphere where the temperature cools and cools and cools up to a point called the tropopause, above which it starts to warm up again because all of that methane and other species that are hanging around absorbing sunlight and causing the local environment to get warmer. And we can maybe break these down a little bit further to say that the deep atmosphere is where you've got thermochemistry taking place, where you've got those volatiles uh, being formed by hydrogenating the elements that are present within Jupiter. Then in the troposphere, you've got the condensation happening to form the clouds. And then above the clouds in the stratosphere, this is where that photochemistry is taking place. So slicing through the atmosphere allows you to sample different regions uh, from the radiative upper layers down into the deep layers below the clouds. So that's what's going on in the vertical, but what about in the horizontal? 
Well, some of you may have seen this wonderful Cassini movie before, which shows how the, the air is zipping east and west around Jupiter. And if you follow any individual cloud features, you can see that there are jets that flow east and west or west uh, to east. And those jets are separating the colorful bands uh, one from the other. Now, broadly speaking, we think there are two different flavors of these jets. In the tropics at the low latitudes, we have um, a, a equatorial zone and neighbouring equatorial belts that may be akin to the Hadley circulation we have here on Earth, with air rising at the equator, then being deflected towards the east as they move polewards, that's the Coriolis effect, then as they sink and they return back towards the equator, they're deflected westward, again, Coriolis effect, and those are the famous trade winds that we might have used to cross the Atlantic back uh, in the 17th and 18th centuries, okay? So the tropics of the giant planets may also have Hadley-like circulations. But then as you go to higher latitudes, it's possible that they have smaller scale circulations on the scale of the belts and zones that we call feral cells. So let's look at those two types of um, circulation patterns in a little bit more depth. So when we look at the temperatures of Jupiter and Saturn, top row, and the distribution of ammonia gas on Jupiter and Saturn in the bottom row, what we find is that the temperature and ammonia distributions are actually consistent with that idea of Hadley cells. If you have air rising, it's going to be bringing ammonia upwards, which it will be at the equator. And as it gets up to the tropopause and starts to expand, you know that as you expand the gas, it cools down. So we have cold and enhanced ammonia indicating rising motion, and warm and uh, depleted ammonia indicating sinking motion. So that idea of rising and falling does appear to be consistent with the data uh, that we have so far for Jupiter and Saturn. And then as you go to higher latitudes, to the mid-latitudes, you can see in uh, microwave light on the left-hand side that these belt and zone structures do persist down below the cloud layers of Jupiter, at least that's as much as we can see uh, with microwave light that probes maybe 300 kilometers or so down below the colorful clouds themselves. The very fact that you've got bright and dark regions in those microwave observations is telling you that whatever drives microwave light, whatever absorbs microwave light is different between belts and zones. And the key absorber is ammonia gas. Now, in the upper levels of the atmosphere, the belts, which are the dark red or brown regions of Jupiter, all appear to be depleted in ammonia gas. And that makes them shine brightly in microwave light because there's nothing there to absorb the microwave light as it's traveling up through the atmosphere. Conversely, the zones are enhanced in ammonia, meaning that they appear dark in microwave light. Now, this all made sense for quite a long time until very recently when we used the microwave instrument on Juno to probe down below the expected layer of the water cloud. And the water is condensing down maybe uh, 10 miles or so down below the regular cloud tops. And if you track an individual bright band from the left hand side of this diagram to the right, you can see that it shifts and changed to becoming a dark band. So bright ammonia depletion becomes replaced by dark ammonia enrichment. And this is telling you that there are circulation patterns on the scale of these belts and zones, but that they appear to flip direction as you peel back more layers of this onion and go deeper down below the water cloud. Now we think that these circulation patterns are feral-like cells, just like we see on the earth, but that they change direction above and below the water cloud at a level that we've started to refer to as the jovicline, playful uh, a play on words with the idea of a thermocline in the Earth's oceans, which separates warmer surface waters of the oceans from deeper, darker, colder waters down below. Now, even the microwave light from Juno can only sample down the top 300 kilometers or so. Remember that Jupiter's radius is some 70,000 kilometers in scale. So that's still only the, the skin of the apple, if you like. However, we can use gravity sounding to peer down deeper into Jupiter's atmosphere. And what they, when they did that, 
they discovered that the winds that we see at the cloud tops that I was describing earlier, they penetrate down some 3000 kilometers or so, and then they decay away to almost nothing. And that the interior of Jupiter is then rotating without these differential winds flowing uh, east and west. So Ju Juno has really shown us that what we see at the cloud tops is just the tip of the iceberg. And as you probe down deeper inside, the circulation patterns appear to change. But by the time you get down to about 3,000 kilometers down, they die away. What's special about 3,000 kilometers down? It's possible that that's where the transition to metallic hydrogen helium is taking place. So Juno is really starting to peel back the layers of Jupiter just here. Let's go back up to the top, though, now and talk about a very famous feature that you can see through your telescopes, the Great Red Spot, here imaged in 2019 by Juno spacecraft and an image put together by uh, Kevin Gill. And in fact, we have been observing the Great Red Spot both with Juno and with ground-based telescopes for some time now. We're aware that the storm has been shrinking in east-west extent for the entire history of the space age and that's slowly circularizing. The north-south extent's pretty much constant, but east-west it's been getting smaller and smaller. That's uh, shrinking. Uh, I don't personally believe that that means the storm is going to go away anytime soon, but it is making it more susceptible to interactions with smaller anticyclones that are coming in from other directions. So, for example, throughout 2019 and to a lesser extent in 2020, we were watching small anticyclones come in, move over the north side of the Great Red Spot and then extrude or pull some of the reddish material out of the storm itself, uh, creating something that we were referring to as flakes. And these flakes of red material were then uh, sort of uh, mixed in and uh, removed in the surrounding environment. Now, the Great Red Spot doesn't show any signs of dissipation, but it's interesting to see that its interactions do appear to be changing with time. More vortices are present then at higher latitudes. So Jupiter has this crown of circumpolar cyclones. There's a polar cyclone right in the center, and then there's eight individual cyclones, each several thousand kilometers across that appear to be stable over the whole five years of the Juno mission. Sadly, we can't see these from Earth because the poles are so uh, edge on from our, our perspective. But certainly when we're there with the spacecraft, we can observe these and how they change over the course of time. And again, this is an infrared image. So dark means more clouds, bright means a gap in the clouds. Those eight cyclones in the northern hemisphere give way to five cyclones, a pentagon of cyclones down in the south polar region. And every now and then, this was quite exciting to watch, a sixth cyclone would try to get in on the act into that pentagon of cyclones. But pretty soon afterwards, the original five would then eject to the interloper. They want to stay as a pentagon. There's something dynamically stable about that interaction, whereas the sixth anticyclone, sorry, the sixth cyclone was ejected and uh, did not sort of stand the test of time. Now, this is very different to what's going on up at Saturn's polar regions. You might be familiar with Saturn's famous, famous hexagonal wave that uh, oscillates around about 75 degrees north latitude. And within the center of that famous hexagon is another cyclone right at the pole where we can see these beautiful clouds being shorn and stretched around the, uh, the, the, the central center of that cyclone, almost like it's a, a plug hole in the top of Saturn where the gas is sinking down in and being swirled around as it descends into the deeper layers of Saturn's atmosphere. Now, so we've talked about the belts and zones on the largest scale. Then we've talked about cyclones on a slightly intermediate scale. But on the smallest scale, what a lot of those Juno observations are telling us about are small storm plumes that rise up from the underlying layers and bring usually bright white icy material up to the cloud tops where they then interact with the prevailing uh, zonal flows. Think of these like cumulonimbus clouds that are popping up from the deeper cloud decks. They might be associated with precipitation, a sort of ammonia snow might be falling around the edges of those cloud decks. And they appear to last just a few days. And sometimes we'll see multiple storm plumes all existing in the same location as we did back in, in 2010. In fact, this particular image is a combination of VLT observations in the infrared and a visible light observation from Dan Parker out in the US 
who was able to see the white spots erupting that we could see as dark, cold plumes uh, in the infrared. So here's a great example where we did need to have the amateur coverage to really understand the time evolution of this complex uh, storm system at the smallest scales. Now, another storm system, in fact, we were talking about this just earlier on, uh, was an eruption of an enormous storm on Saturn back in uh, late 2010 and went on into 2011. Cassini was there at the time and was able to capture some stunning close-up images. We were also able to hear the, the crackle of the lightning strikes that was happening within the storm plume itself. Uh, it formed this long snake-like structure that eventually wrapped all of the way around Saturn's northern hemisphere as it was being blown around by the prevailing winds. And in fact, when the head of the storm caught up with the tail of the storm, that's where things seemed to calm down and the lightning activity uh, seemed to shut off. Now, this is all happening down at cloud layer. But if you look in the infrared, particularly at wavelengths that are sensitive to light up in the stratosphere, we observed what was we have a completely uh, unexpected evolution of a large hot spot right over the top of this storm system. And just to give you an idea of how unusual this was, this stratospheric hotspot was some 80 degrees warmer than its surroundings. So that was a storm system causing a temperature change of 80 degrees. And we were calling this, this weird structure the beacon, because of course, when Saturn rotates once every 10 hours, that glowing hot infrared storm system was being uh, sort of gazing out upon the solar system, if you like, and being observed once every 10 hour rotation. So this was really something exciting to be uh, to be looking at. And it's all being driven by dynamics on small scales. Now, as you go from storms and vortices and belts and zones, the thing that we're trying to understand is the temporal variability of those features. This um, collection of images on the top row that spans 17 years is almost entirely from amateur observers, and it shows you how the southern equatorial belt and the northern equatorial belt of Jupiter change over the course of time. Sometimes the southern equatorial belt can disappear entirely, it can fade over, Whereas the North Equatorial Belt appears to shrink and contract and shrink and contract with a four to five year timescale. So the only way we can really appreciate that is by um, utilizing the army of citizen scientists, of, uh, of amateur astronomers to look at Jupiter regularly and allow us to build up this sort of time series. And one discovery that we've made recently with uh, that kind of time series is that every six to seven years or so, the equator undergoes a rather dramatic change where the normal bright white fluffy clouds dissipate or maybe they sublimate or evaporate off, revealing the structures down at depth. So those images on the left hand side in 2007, they show a darker equator than normal, and they show that that dark equator is actually gaps in the clouds, allowing us to see infrared light emanating from deeper levels. Whereas in 2016, on the right hand side, you've got a more typical looking Jupiter with a thick cloudy band over the equator that's causing it to be dark in the infrared. These were happening every six to seven years. And so we had a prediction that one would occur in 2019-20. And although it hasn't been quite the same level of um, disturbance as previous years, this Hubble image, which was taken last year, does show that the equator has got this rather unusual reddish brown appearance at the moment. And in fact, that reddish brown appearance is still there today if you're able to look at it um, through your telescope. So signs that Jupiter's atmosphere is um, undergoing these natural cycles, and we don't really know or understand what drives a six to seven year period in the Jovian cloud tops. Here's another example of that north and south equatorial belt fading and changing uh, with time from 2010, where the SEB was completely faded over, to 2011, where those clouds dissipated and allow us to see down into the deeper, uh, darker colours. So these observations are taken maybe over the course of a few uh, weeks or months during an individual apparition, and then we'll compare them to the next apparition and the next to try to understand what's going on. Time scales become really long, though, if you want to study the seasonal evolution of a giant planet. Now, Jupiter has only a tiny little tilt, so we don't see seasonal effects there. But the other giants have much more substantial seasons. And the best for us to study 
is the seasonal evolution of Saturn. So the montage of images on the left, I think that's a collection from uh, the Damien Peach looking at Saturn over the course of half a Saturnian year, whereas the Cassini image on the bottom right shows a, an observation from, uh, I think that was mid northern spring. So the sunlight is coming down onto the northern hemisphere and the rings are casting that beautiful shadow down onto the southern hemisphere. Now, by observing Saturn over the course of time, we could actually look at the temperatures evolving as spring changed to summer, to autumn, to winter, and it changes in the same way as the Earth's atmospheric temperatures do. So the northern winter on the left became warmer and warmer and warmer as we headed through to summer at the end of the Cassini mission. And we could actually track the evolution of warm and cold patterns as they were descending from the stratospheric pressure levels down into the troposphere on the right hand side. You can see how dynamic this system is and how important it is to have time resolved observations of these worlds. And part of the reason for doing that is because we're starting to believe that the giant planets have natural oscillations of their climate that are happening over time scales that are currently quite hard to understand. Some of them are seasonal, that's relatively straightforward, but some of them are opening on, operating on sub-seasonal timescales, which has really got us scratching our heads. Maybe this is something being driven from outside, maybe a cycle in the magnetosphere is somehow influencing the, the cloud levels that we see, or maybe something from really deep down within these giant planets is modulating the formation of clouds and the degree of convective activity that we see down uh, in the deeper layers. Now, this is quite speculative, but maybe these have got some kind of connections to the climate oscillations that we see here on Earth. You may have heard of El Nino or ENSO, which uh, affects the uh, meteorological, the weather patterns in the uh, Pacific Ocean and its relation to the North Atlantic Oscillation, the Madden Julian Oscillation, and also the quasi biennial oscillation in the Earth's tropical stratosphere. So atmospheres have a sort of heartbeat, if you like. They have a, a regular pattern that we can use to diagnose uh, their properties. We've been studying this for decades on Earth, but now we have enough time-resolved information to start to say something about that for the giant planets as well. So with that, I'll just seek into the final few minutes of this presentation. I realize that we're heading towards uh, three o'clock now, so I won't take too long. The Juno spacecraft is uh, now in its extended mission phase. We've just had Perigeo 37, we've got 38 coming up at the end of the month. And as we go through these additional Perigeos, the actual latitude of closest approach is shifting further and further northwards, which means that our highest resolution observations of the polar regions of Jupiter are still to come. And in addition to looking at Jupiter in ever more depth, this extended mission is also allowing Juno to get some fantastic new observations of the Galilean satellites on some of the flybys that you can see there on the screen in front of you. Now the Galilean satellites or the worlds of ice and fire as I've got on this particular uh, shot here um, really are our best locations to go and explore the emergence of habitable environments around giant planets and that is the key goal of the European Space Agency's first ever mission to the Jovian system. The Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer or JUICE uh, is going to go and explore particularly Ganymede, the largest moon in our solar system, but also Europa and Callisto and some distant observations from Io as well. And I'm really proud and privileged to be part of this mission. We've been developing it for well over a decade uh, now. It was selected um, back in 2012. Uh, it's currently under development. It's very, very close to being uh, completed and it will launch in 2023. So just a, a you know, handful of months time. It will then take a fair few years to get out to Jupiter doing an interplanetary uh, tour before it gets out there. But finally, in around about 2031, it will go into orbit around Jupiter. It will do a comprehensive tour of the Jovian system, the atmosphere, magnetosphere, the icy satellites over the course of about three and a half years. And then it will become humanity's first ever robotic orbiter of an icy moon. It will go into orbit around Ganymede to give us a close-up uh, observations and interrogation of what the surface of Ganymede is really like. So that's something that we're involved in in Leicester and we're really excited to see happening. 
slightly uh, closer in terms of time, though, is the imminent launch of the James Webb Space Telescope, which is going up uh, on December the 18th after a long, uh, long phase of development. It's finally going to get to launch. We're all uh, crossing our fingers and toes because this enormous beast of a telescope has got to unfold in space, a very delicate origami-like process as it transits out to the L2 Lagrange point opens up its mirror, deploys its sun shield and starts to give us unprecedented new infrared views of the universe, in addition to looking at all of the giant planets of our solar system to hopefully teach us a little more about the atmospheres of the four worlds that are close, uh, close to home. And finally, I mentioned that uh, I had a dream for the future that I would love to see the sort of um, interrogation we've done of Jupiter and Saturn with the Juno and Cassini missions. I'd love to see that extended to the distant ice giants Uranus and Neptune. Now, these are fiendishly hard targets uh, to get to. It takes an extremely long period of time, eight to 15 years, depending on the trajectory to get out to one of these locations. But once we're there, they're once again a wonderland for planetary scientists from the ice giant itself, which we said is a, is a kind of archetype for some of the sub Neptunes that we see out in the distant universe to their delicate ring systems, their collection of icy satellites, some of them which may possess deep oceans down at depth within their interiors below icy crusts and magnetic fields that are unlike anything we've seen anywhere in the solar system, nothing like Jupiter or Saturn and very much uh, worlds uh, fascinating environments for us to go and explore in their own right. So with that, I'll finish on this, again, lovely image put together by Gerald and Sean using data from the Juno spacecraft, and just point out that we've had a several decades now of very in-depth observation from these spacecraft observations, coupled with ground-based facilities and amateur astronomers teaching us about the dynamics, the chemistry, the meteorology of the atmospheres themselves, how they change with time, and now slowly starting to reveal that the giant planets have natural oscillations in their, their climates that we are still struggling to understand and we need to piece together over the next few years. <coughs> we do need ground-based observations to probe the long time scales at work around these giant planets and that the next few years should hopefully give us the opportunity to do just that with things like James Webb, the JUICE spacecraft and something we haven't talked about which is the next generation of extremely large telescopes. So with that I'm going to hand back to Robin. I want to say thank you to all of you for listening and thanks again for the invitation and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Super. Thank you very much, Lee. And uh, as a slight aside, it occurs to me that the career of a planetary scientist has got something in common with that of a landscape gardener, like Capability Brown, who planted all those trees back in the 18th century. And just now we're enjoying the landscape. So your career is, is spans an equivalent length of time. You don't get to see the fruits of your labours for That's many years. True. That's very true. And in fact, the Cassini mission, um, I, I stood on the shoulders of giants. The Cassini mission was developed uh, when I was a child back in the early 1980s. And then as a graduate student in the 2000s, I got to uh, work with the data sets themselves. So I'm hoping that whatever we can get going now for the ice giants, it'll be our graduates, maybe people not even born yet, who will be analysing the data from those sorts of missions. So there's hope for the youngsters uh, Absolutely. to be able yes. to participate in this right now. If you'd like to stop sharing your screen, then we should be able to see, well, I can probably see all the the gallery of participants. And um, if people have got questions, could they uh, raise a hand? I see that Martin's um, shared his video already. Martin, have you got a question? You were yes. in Hi, the firing Lee. line. You've got some of yes. those pictures there yourself. Great uh, presentation there. I really enjoyed that. Um, something I've seen recently are um, Aurora in the UV on Saturn uh, from orbit, I believe. Do you think that that's something that could be seen by amateurs using UV filters or is it too short a wavelength of uh, UV? Yeah, I, I suspect that's going to be a, a considerable challenge to do um, with an amateur facility. You'd, you'd need quite narrow band filters to be able to cut out any of the scattered light that was present. And often, um, I, I don't know the exact images you're referring to, but often the Cassini images where they were looking for 
the um, aurora themselves around Saturn. They'd be done from the night side so that even the Cassini was doing it without the scattered sunlight uh, causing problems for them. The, um, uh, where we do a lot of auroral work for Jupiter and Saturn is actually in the near infrared around three to four microns, which at the moment right. is out of reach of, um, of amateur techniques. But certainly, um, you know, it's not beyond the pale that in the years to come, we might have people reaching out to those wavelengths to, uh, to be able to see the aurora there, where they shine so brightly because there's so much methane absorbing all the scattered sunlight, meaning yeah. that the only thing we see are the aurora. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. There's a challenge laid down for you. <laughs> well, Catherine's got her hand up. Again. Um, why do you think Derby and Rolls-Royce Nuclear are within about a mile of where I live? And in addition to doing nuclear reactors for submarines and also for the small modular reactors, they're also working on reactors for spacecraft. Right. And I've heard, heard that's to do things like mine the asteroid belt. Now, uh, are you working on proposals to actually use technology like, like that for like go and send out huge craft to like maybe even do a sample return missions and things? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And, and power, whenever you're doing the outer solar system, power is a tremendous challenge uh, for any spacecraft. Um, so that, well, there's, there's two things. Let's, there's actually three. Uh, <laughs> we, use, we use the radioactive decay of isotopes like plutonium or americium in order to provide heat to keep the spacecraft warm and also to provide electrical power for all of our instruments and our telecommunications and all that sort of thing. Those two technologies are relatively mature and things like Cassini were using radioactive decay to provide its power for, for many years. Um, nuclear propulsion though, at the moment is still quite a risky thing uh, from the perspective of spacecraft design. Unfortunately, we live in an era where when a big mission, particularly to the outer solar system flies, um, you're only gonna get one shot. And so they're quite risk averse and they tend to take off the shelf technologies or things that are got a, a high level of technological maturity in order to ensure that that one shot is going to work. And so big concepts with nuclear powered uh, drives to get out to, I don't know, Uranus or Neptune, at the moment, they're a fair way off in the future. My expectation is you'll see a conventional mission which uses nuclear fuel for electricity and for heating, but not for propulsion. Propulsion will still be chemical for a few years to come. Thank you. You're welcome. I don't, don't think. Right, have we got any further questions there? The sort of thing that crops up during the talk and then you forget it when <laughs> the talk is over. It's, uh, oh, uh, have you got another one, Catherine, or is that still the same hand? Uh, no, it's just another one. But, All right, but go on. Let's then. do somebody else first. Uh, okay, we've got someone describe yeah. this iPad appearing. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's, it's me, Robin, John Hendry. Oh, just one question was, um, what was the website that um, that he uh, was telling you about, the, the Juno one, where you can see all those images? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, it's called Mission Juno. Uh, let yep. me just see if I can get the, I've got my computer open right here, missionjuno.swri.edu. In fact, what I'll do, can you see the chat for the Zoom window? I'm just pasting it in there. So feel free to go and there have a look uh, for that. All right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. And they, they, they what um, th that, can, that keeps all the various news releases, all the information that we're learning about Jupiter. But also there's a link on there to JunoCam, the instrument. And that instrument is the one that's delivering those glorious images that you can go and download and process yourself. Yeah. Oh, very good. Yeah, lovely. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Enjoy. Yes. Okay, back to Catherine then. Thank you, John. Uh, you mentioned about the photochemistry on on the simple molecules and like where they go and ionize the molecules and you get different things. Uh, there's a lot of like of brownie reddish colors on Jupiter. Mm. Are those actually th uh, tholins? So tholins. Um... Yeah, so tholins are often thought of as a sort of gunk that's made from carbon photochemistry and nitrogen photochemistry, then sort of raining down and forming this hydrocarbon-like material. Yeah. Um, my, I don't particularly feel that that's the right answer for Jupiter. For Jupiter, I think that when you have these 
powerful uh, upwellings from deeper down within the belts and zones. I think they're dredging sulfur-based materials and phosphorus-based materials wow. up to the level where they can be photolyzed wow. by UV irradiation, and that the products of that photolysis is what causes it to take on the reddish brown appearance. And one idea for why the great red spot appears to be redder than any other feature on Jupiter mm. is that you've got that convection taking place within the great red spot, but the winds that spin around the periphery act as a sort of barrier, keeping it all contained in there. So it can literally sit up at the top of the clouds and cook for longer without being buffeted by other storms coming in. So again, I think that could be sulfurous or phosphorus based material that's being photolyzed high up above the cloud tops. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, thank you. I've, I've got a question and you were talking about the fact that planetary climates seem to go through waves of, of uh, different characteristics. Does that have anything to tell us about our own atmosphere? Well, the timescales that we're currently probing for the giants are on the order of a, a giant planet year. Okay, So the thing to compare it to would be to climate scales on the order of an Earth year here on our planet. And again, that comes back to things like the El Nino oscillation, the North Atlantic oscillation, and something called the quasi-biennial oscillation, which has got a 28-month period. What we cannot say now, simply because we haven't been observing for long enough, is whether these giants will change their temperatures or their conditions over the course of very, very long spans of time, multiple giant planet years. And of course, in our own atmosphere, we've got this vast, uncontrolled experiment taking place at the moment where we're pumping a lot of this radiatively active gas carbon dioxide up there. That's not happening on any other planet. It's only a, a consequence of us uh, here on planet Earth. Uh, so I think we, what people often ask me, can what we're learning from the giants teach us something about what we're, what we're doing, what's happening down here on planet Earth. And I think that's the wrong way around to think about it. I think all of the information we've learned from studying our own climate system, what we can then do is we take that and we test it to its absolute extremes for the giant planets and see if the theory or the idea breaks. That never happens, okay? That never actually, we never come to a point where we go, we've misunderstood something about our own climate system in order to explain a giant planet, for example. So the flow of information is very much from the, the decades and decades of understanding Earth's climate and meteorology and applying that then to what we're seeing on the uh, other worlds in our solar system as well. Fine. OK, so um, we're still using Earth as a model for the other planets rather than the other way around. Although, I would say so. I would who knows? Say so. Yeah. OK, well, uh, I think that's all the questions. So I'd like to thank Lee very much indeed for for his really fascinating talk. And uh, I guess people will want to watch it again. I'm sure it will be available on YouTube when we put it on. Um, so uh, again, oh, John has got. I think a question, John Murrell. I can see a hand appearing there. It's supposed to be a clap, but I will, will oh. ask a quick question. Um, <laughs> so Lee, um, thanks for the talk. What, one quick question. The sun obviously presumably has a impacts on the amount of aurora every 11 year cycle. Does it have any other impacts that we know of on the atmospheres of the outer planets? That's a really interesting question. Um, Again, we, we haven't, we, our time series of observations of the giants is still relatively short, but it is now sufficient that if there was, you know, the sun's got this 11 year cycle okay, mm. in terms of the amount of UV output, yeah. and also in terms of the, the, the size of the, the, the heliosphere and how many galactic cosmic rays can come in. And we do think that in some cases, um, that 11 year cycle of the sun influences the formation of clouds on some of these giant planets mm. but i would say it's a it's a secondary or even tertiary effect mm. on the clouds rather than being a primary influence the aurora is the most dramatic that we can see you know that literally pulses and changes and expands as solar wind compressions wash over the giant planets and sort of rattle the magnetic field mm. lines as mm. 
as mm. they go. But um, yeah, in, it's an interesting question. If we observe for another 50 years, maybe we'll actually have a better <laughs> answer to I don't think I'll be around then to see that, but never mind. Oh, you, you never know. You never know. <laughs> Some of our junior thanks astronomers hopefully will be able to answer those questions. Sure. Okay, thanks very much, Lee. Uh, now it's now five past. We've got a five minute break uh, until. Uh, Ian takes over and he's going to talk about setting up for planetary imaging. So we'll say goodbye to Lee and I will uh, just uh, share my screen with a um, with a caption card for a little while. OK, and well, have we a great get... rest of the uh, have a great rest of the day, Robin. And thanks for inviting me again. And uh, yeah, see you all soon. Thanks Thank so you, much, Lee. Lee. Thank okay. you. Bye bye. Back in five minutes. Oh, forget the sign that says. <laughs> 1400, that's not true anymore. And just to keep you happy, do you recognise that? Wowee, yes, of course I do. <laughs> I believe you well, built it. I did. Yes, well, yes. We've, we've, we've shown the, with that system, we've um, shown that there are spiral arms in the Milky Way galaxy. And also, um, when some people produce a lovely picture of what the galaxy should look like, I, I thought it um, didn't look right. The arms were spiral arms were too tightly wound, so I let them know, and I make, I bet others did as well. And the next picture that came out was much more like what we'd seen. But also, you can use it to actually prove the existence of dark matter. Oh, right. Uh, by measuring how fast uh, M thirty three is rotating, and calculating the mass from that, and comparing that with the mm. light to mass ratio. Anyway, I so, think I think when I was there, they hadn't actually discovered dark matter. That was two thousand and one, I think. No, no, they've known about, or well, we may not have done it with that telescope, but I mean, dark no. matter has been known about since the 1930s. Mm. But, uh, but anyway, yes, I, uh, you obviously did our course or something. That's fantastic. Yes, yeah, that was a weekend course. Yeah. There was Brilliant. a young Tim there, I think he's a graduate student. or no, he's, he's, student. he's a professor now. Yes, that's right. Oh, good. We all get old, I'm afraid. Hmm. Is it still there, I bet? Oh, yes, Paper we're still posted. using it. Yeah, 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 we're still using it. We've upgraded the receiver, I think, from maybe when you saw, when you used it, but it's mm. still doing the same thing and more. Mm. Oh, I, that's, I haven't got many pictures of what we used to do. It's so nice to see that. Thank you very much. I, I can send you. I've got, I've got your email. I'll send you a couple. Oh, that'd be nice. Thank you very much. Remind me of my old days. I'm still there. We haven't been into Jogger for a long time, but we have Zoom meetings yeah. every week. Yes, now there's, there's a lot. Of, we were still using pen recorders then, of course. Yes, we were. We managed to slew the 42 foot across the sun accidentally. Ah, the pen recorder didn't. Well, we were going from one target to the other, and of yeah, course, yes, it just no. decided to take a straight line. And the pen recorder sort of tried to bend itself around the far side of the. Yeah, we, we can't. We, we can't observe. Um, the crab pulsar, which we do most of the time for about a week in the summer, because it's basically uh, uh, behind the sun. Yes, yes. Very good. Well, nice to chat. I get the old, I guess the receiver gets a bit warm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> well, Okay, Ian, I guess people have stretched their legs and done whatever they do during breaks. So um, it's now just getting yeah. on to uh, 10 past, which is the time for your talk. It's about setting up for planetary imaging. And this is the choice of cameras, how 
you actually stick them on the telescope and, and getting ready, all that sort of thing. I know you've been in discussion with Martin about this. Martin will be uh, also covering the actual business of taking captures, doing captures and then processing afterwards. So this is all about the imaging side of thing, which a lot of people do these days. I was glad that Martin was able to cover the visual observation and there are um, people who spend all their time doing drawings, um, don't do any imaging. David Graham is one of them. And um, Paul Abel, of course, is a very well-known uh, um, advocate of visual observing. And every time he, I, I see him, he says, are you, are you looking at the planets yet, Robin? <laughs> and, uh, so there is uh, still a move to, to undertake visual observation. But we're now talking mostly about, about imaging. So Ian, over to you. I think you should be able to share your screen. Let's have a go. I think so. Hold tight. Um, no, I think I'm seeing yours at the moment. Oh, hold tight. Let's see what this does. Can yeah, you see that? That's starting to, to starting to happen. Yes. It says Ian okay. Morrison started screen sharing. I've got it up on my screen. Can you see it, Robin? Um, Obviously you can't. Uh, no, I got a strange thing saying, oh, it says it still says you've started screen sharing. Martin, can you um, tell me if you can see him? No, I can see the same as you. Ian Morrison has started screen sharing. Just oh, well, all right. Well, let's get out of this for a minute. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Go out and go back in, I think. Uh, I can't actually get out of the. Right, let's just um, get out of that. Now let me try and see what we're it's doing. It's encouraging that it allows you to to screen share, so it doesn't seem let's to be that. And now, um, stop share. Now I'll try and share again. All right. Yeah. Ah, uh, try this one. I think I was sharing your picture. Is that any better? Ah, yeah. Now we've got the, we've now got the, uh, not the slide. Ah, oh, that's the slideshow. Yes, you're there. That's oh, it. Good. So I think I was getting you for some reason because you were up on the screen and it picked you up. Anyway, not to worry. Good afternoon again, everybody. So this is all about uh, getting ready for imaging and a bit about the cameras that we use to do it. And I hope this doesn't clash too much with what... Uh, Martin's going to tell us, but uh, we, sh we shall find out. Anyway, cross fingers. So now let's begin. Um, combating the atmosphere. We have a problem, and you've heard it about already. Turbulence gives rise to very poor seeing. In the atmosphere, we have, I think, what are called atmospheric cells. So the atmosphere is made up of these cells of differing refractive index, which act like little prisms. That's a simple way of thinking about it, but deflecting the light. As they pass across the line of sight, they make the image move about. And I hope you can see this. Um, at the top there left is a star seen imaged in fact from Chile, where it's pretty good. And uh, just below it is a star image from Germany where it wasn't so good. And you can see on the right what's happening to a star image and also what happens if you were trying to image. I hope some of you will recognize the crater Clavius or Clavius on the moon. So that's what we have to contend with. Now, the, the way that it's done these days is called lucky imaging. It involves the taking of very many short exposures in a video sequence, hoping that some will be captured when only one cell of the atmosphere is in the line of sight. So although the images might move around, if there's only one cell in the line of sight, that image should be sharp. And what you then do, as Martin's gonna show us, I'm sure, the sharpest are then collect, um, selected, aligned, and stacked. So lucky imaging allows us to take advantage of the fleeting moments of good seeing, which actually is why in the past you could see more looking at, say, Jupiter than you could with a, a, a photograph. The photograph would have quite a long exposure and everything gets blurred, but your eye could actually see details in those brief moments when the seeing in the line of sight was best. Um, as the cells are moving rapidly above the telescope, 
the exposures need to be very short. That means that the images must be downloaded into the imaging computer quickly. And this is by far easiest if you use a very small sensor. That doesn't really make a problem because planets, as we've, seen, uh, as we've heard already, have a very small angular size. Things began quite some time ago when people realized that a webcam made by Philips called the Tucam Pro 2 could in fact be adapted to image the planets. And you could actually buy this little adapter. Can you see on the right hand side, you took the lens out of the camera, screwed in that adapter and attached it to your telescope. Um, the sensor was a few millimeters, 6.4 times 4.8, had 640 by 480 pixels, nine pixels, micron size, that's important. We'll talk about micron sizes of pixels a bit later on. But nevertheless, it was there. And I think this was the first picture I took of it a long time ago with the Philips 2 cam. I'm not brilliant, but I am by no means a, a good planetary imager. Uh, but nevertheless, I was quite pleased with that when I did it again, that was simply using the a Philips 2 cam pro and not a particularly te a big telescope. You can just make a little bit of detail in the bands on the surface there. And obviously Cassini's division, and I think you can see the crate ring, which is there and there, but uh, nothing like the pictures that uh, Martin was showing us earlier. Um, now, people then realized that there was a market for this. I think they, they, they put the price of the Philips 2 cam up considerably, but firms like Imaging Source that basically provide cameras for security and then Point Grey uh, company, they produce these cameras here. You see the imaging source ones on the left. They all look the same, but different sensors. I've got one monochrome, one monochrome and one color of those, and also a mono camera produced by Point Grey. And that's actually quite tiny. You can see compared to the little one and a quarter inch adapter on the front. And uh, just to make a point that uh, Martin was saying, uh, this is not very good, but it was when Mars was close, but when it was actually very small in angular size, I think it was only about 12 to 14 arc seconds across. And that's what I got using that little um, imaging source camera. And I've just done, I did just what Martin did. I used WinDupos to actually show me what ought to be there, which is the image on the right. And at least you can see the some comparison. But that of course was when Mars was really very small at its closest approach. It's been much bigger uh, since then. Now there's a real problem if you're using these very small sensor sized webcams. And that's getting the planet image onto the sensor. And the only way I know to do this without tearing one's hair out, and I actually mean that, I've got none left basically, is to use what's called a flip mirror. You put that between the back of the scope, as you see there, and the camera. It actually um, has the advantage of uh, putting the camera at about the right point to get the correct focal plane with, as was mentioned earlier, um, the primary of that uh, smith cassegrain um, at about the right distance from the secondary. So what you do is you have it with the mirror at 45 degrees and you look at that through a, a, an eyepiece. And that in fact, I think is one I have. Um, it's a Teleview, I think it's a 32 millimeter one. It's the largest um, field of view you can get with a one and a quarter eyepiece. So you find Jupiter with that, and that's obviously no harder than when you're doing it just with a simple eyepiece. When you've got it pretty much damn center, you can then flip the mirror so it goes out of the field of view and onto the sensor. And one thing you can do, you can make sure that the focal plane of your eyepiece matches that of the camera, so that when you flip it over, uh, Jupiter should be pretty much in focus. So that's the idea of a flip mirror. I'll show you another version that I've got a little bit later on. So there we go. Now, those were USB 2 webcams. Their download rate wasn't very high. Uh, we now have many now made with a USB 3 interface and they're much, much faster upload speed. So you can take more frames in a given time. As I'm sure Martin will tell you, this is a very great help when imaging Jupiter and Saturn because they rotate quite quickly. They have days plus or minus a bit on 10 hours. And many of these are sold by ZWO, who seem to have almost cornered the market in planetary webcams. And here's one of them. It's only 145 pounds. It's a color one. 
it's got quite a small sensor, 4.8 times 3.6 millimeters, but you've got more pixels and you've also got a smaller pixel size than that Toucan Pro. So that's actually a pretty good starting point. Um, the efficiency of these latest Sony sensors is pretty good. This one goes up to about 68% in the green and obviously and not much less actually in the red, but a fair bit less in the blue. So that's really quite useful. And it has a little filter in front uh, to cut out the UV and the infrared. Can you see that? That uh, filter cuts out very steeply at 700 uh, nanometers. So you don't get worrisome um, bloating really because the infrared uh, might well be in a different focus if you're using a refractor. So that's a very nice one. And this is possibly the best one you could buy. I do in fact have the mono version, but not the color one. The color one's about 286 pounds. The sensor is a bit bigger, 7.4 times five millimeters. You can see there are many more pixels and it's a 2.4 micron pixel size. I'm gonna talk about pixel size quite a bit uh, a little bit later on. So if, if you were going to think about buying a webcam to do imaging, that is the one I think I would suggest. Martin may have other ideas. I hope he will tell you later on. Now, a surprise. Last summer, I bought myself a deep sky object imaging camera with a micro four thirds sensor. They're again sold either by ZWO or Altair Astro sell the same thing essentially, looks identical, at a somewhat lower price. Um, they normally have 11 megapixels, this particular one. So it'd be fairly slow to download or upload. Um, but the great thing is using something like SharpCap, you can adjust the size of the image that you're trying to capture to make it much faster. So you can actually get quite a high frame rate. So the great thing is you don't need to have one of these flip mirrors anymore because using the full size, which gives you basically uh, an area equivalent to what you'd get with a one and a quarter eyepiece uh, using the full amount. So you can easily find Jupiter, center it, then you can reduce the image size. It won't be in the center. Um, center it again, reduce the image size, and you get down to something where you nicely cover the planet with some space around it so it doesn't sort of move out of the frame. And, and that's great. And that's what I've been doing um, in the last sort of nine months when I've had a go. Um, here's the example I've got. It's the Alta Astro fan cool camera. That's 599. In fact, I've got the cooled one. I was going to buy um, the fan cooled one, better than a DSLR. Um, the cooled one is about 999, 899 actually. And uh, I happened to find on UK Astro by Cell. Never look at that. It's a terrible thing to look at because you find so many nice things to buy. And that was, in fact, £610. So it was obviously better to get the cool version, which is great for doing deep sky imaging. However, you don't need it for doing planetary imaging or taking very short exposures. So that's got a 16 times 12.6 millimeter sensor size. You can see the pixels there. You don't use them all when you're doing planetary imaging. But nevertheless, it can give you basically 70 frames per second at a reasonable size. However, let me just say this three exclamation marks. It's not the camera that will usually be the limiting factor determining the frame rate. I have a specific i5 processor that I use for my imaging. To get any decent frame rate at all, I had to replace the standard hard drive with one of these solid state drives. And then I capture the images onto an external solid state drive. And that's the only way I can get perhaps 30 frames per second, perhaps sometimes a bit more. So your actual capturing computer is quite important. And the other thing to say really, is that if you're taking uh, very long video sequences, and I do the moon mostly, and I was taking uh, quite a number of six gigabyte video sequences using the full frame area, you need a fairly powerful i7 processor to actually um, run them fairly quickly. I found there's a company in, in Manchester that actually will sell refurbished i7 machines for about 340 pounds. I got one of those and it really is very, very good. So look, look around for refurbished computers and you can get surprisingly powerful ones for not too much money. Now, using a DSLR, well, let's think about this. 
DSLRs or mirrorless cameras, which a lot of us are buying now, can take very good videos. So you might think, well, let's use one of those to do a video of the planets. There's a problem. The sensor size of at least one of mine, a 24 megapixel camera, is 6,000 by 4,000 pixels. But the output might be typically 1,920 times 1080. That's, um, I think, oh, it's one of, the, one of the reasonably high quality outputs. So can you see you're only using about one in three pixels? So you're not properly sampling a planetary image. You really want every pixel of a small area to be used. Well, if you've got a Canon camera, you can do it. Because if you've got a live view DSLR, and virtually every Canon camera for Yonks has been a live view camera, there's a piece of free software called EOS Movie Record, and you can use that to capture your images. And this is, in fact, what I was using. Um, it's on the back of one of my refractors. Then I was using a Vixen flip mirror, which is quite useful because um, uh, the, the bit you want, the sensor that you're going to use in the camera isn't that great. I used that. Um, in fact, that was a Teleview PowerMate, uh, but it could be a Barlow to give me uh, a reasonable image size. And you have to have a suitable mount. Uh, obviously, it's called a T-mount to couple with that. So that was what I was using. Now, this is what you see. Oh, yes, the flip mirror also means the sensor is at the focal plane. And uh, if you don't have a flip mirror, one will usually need a barrel extender when used with a refractor. And the barrel extender is the bit that's over on the top here. The point is this. They design refractors so that you get to focus easily when you're using a star diagonal. If you're not, you have two problems. If you just try and fit the camera on the back, you won't get to focus because you'll be too close. Um, if you have or if you use uh, the um, diagonal, you'll be too far away. And basically what one does is to use a barrel extender here, the thing on the right. You then have a T-mount. Um, here's a bayonet that actually goes into the front of the camera and that screws onto this bit which is a two inch, in this case, barrel. You don't need to use two inch necessarily for planets, but that basically fits in there. This goes into the barrel extender and that goes uh, into the telescope. And I would just say that if you are trying to use single images, which you obviously can do, um, then usually the image scale is too small. And over on the left there, you can see a, a two times Barlow, which can be used to make the image bigger. But to be perfectly honest, if people are doing planetary imaging now, they're using telescopes with webcams. Could be that um, image you get with the EOS movie record. And this is captured as I was actually imaging uh, uh, Jupiter some time ago. For some reason, I couldn't capture the whole of the frame, but you'll see the bit that matters. And what it has in the middle of the frame, it's got this rectangle. And up here, there's a thing that says zoom five times. If you click on that, then what happens is it basically just takes that central part of the sensor using every pixel. So you have made that into a webcam and you get a reasonably good frame rate as well. So it's a wonderful piece of software, EOS Movie Record. And then you record uh, video sequences just as if you're using a webcam. And Martin will be telling you all about that. So that's one way of doing it with a Canon camera. And this is when I used that actually some time ago. Uh, that's my 9.25 inch Schmidt Cassegrain. Uh, I'm not the greatest of planetary images, but that one on the upper left isn't so bad. You can see some of the details. And in fact, I, the picture on the lower right is just the same. I was using that for a demonstration showing the bits that you can see. Um, so you can do quite reasonable imaging with a 9.25. I'm afraid to say that where I live, in the UK is not the place, best place for imaging. We're going to talk about that at the very end. So you can use mono webcams. And in principle, they can give you a higher resolution because every pixel is used for, uh, uh, as opposed to one in two in four for green, one in four for red, and one in four for blue. So that can be better, but you will need a filter wheel and RGB filters. I do have all of that. And I'm aiming to have a go of Jupiter um, with Jupiter uh, on the next apparition. 
you've got to be fairly quick about it because of the fast rotation of Jupiter and Saturn. And I'm sure Martin's going to cover this, so I'm not going to say any more about it. But nevertheless, uh, they are perhaps the best way of doing it. And you'll hear more about that later on. This is quite an important aspect of planetary imaging. You've got to get the most out of what your telescope can provide, which means that your webcam has got to sample the planet's surface sufficiently well so you don't lose any information. And I'm sure many of you will have heard of the Nyquist sampling theorem. And you usually hear it saying that you've got to do something um, with twice the, 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 the amount, I, I get this right, you've got to sample at twice the amount of resolution that you want, halve it. In fact, if you're sampling a surface, it's actually times three. So if you're trying to image a planet, let's say with a resolution of one arc second, you really want each of your pixels to suspend no more than about 0.3 of an arc second. So I'll say that again. If you want to image with a resolution of one arc second that your particular telescope might give you, assuming you've got rid of the seeing, then you need to have pixels which subtend about a third of that. So that's what I've just said here. The Nyquist theorem, to capture all the detail on a planet's surface, the pixels should subtend one third the angular size of the hoped for resolution. And there we've got uh, some resolutions. I made those earlier. So you can see that with an eight inch telescope, you might hope to get to 0.7 arc seconds, 12 inch 0.5, 14 inch, even better. Now, lucky imaging might remove the limits due to the atmosphere and achieve this resolution when the seeing is exceptional. And I think that is actually true. I'm sure Martin will say more about that. I haven't proved it with planets, but I have proved it on the moon. Um, this is an image I took of the moon. Um, you may see the date. Uh, it's covered up on my, my screen. I had to take 56 individual video sequences covering different little areas of the moon and use a program called Microsoft Ice to put them all together. And the, the, the whole image, I think, was about 7,500 pixels across. So I was certainly sampling it pretty well. Uh, you can see some little sections of it there, but I've just blown up a couple on the next uh, picture here. There's the Alpine Valley. The area around the Alpine Valley is very odd. You see all that ruffling. But can you see right in the center here, the rill? I have never, ever seen that. It's only about seven kilometers wide. I think some little craters here as well. So that shows you I was getting pretty good resolution. And down here is the Hyginus crater, which actually is, is, is a volcanic uh, crater. It's, it's basically a collapsed um, surface which has dropped down into a sinkhole. I think probably there was, in fact, um, one of these lava tubes, and they're much bigger on the moon along here. And here you can see where craters have been formed when the surface has actually fallen down into the lava tube. Um, there was a wonderful image produced about 10 years ago called the World Record Lunar Image. And I think Patrick Moore got 10 of the world's top, or no, 10 of the country's top lunar and planetary images together um, in his um, garden in Celsi. And uh, they produced, I think, 218 panes to cover the moon surface. And they produced an image which actually is essentially the same as mine. The resolution of that and mine is about the same. Now, it is actually possible um, to analyze um, a ridge of a, say, the, the edge of a crater to tell you what the actual resolution you've got is. And I got 0.7 of an arc second. Um, so you can, if the seeing is good, get rid of the atmosphere. And one thing, just to um, complement what, or re, re, re-say what Martin said, I did that in the infrared. And as he said, the seeing tends to be much better in the infrared, which helped me get that resolution. So with a bit of luck, you can eliminate the effects of the atmosphere. So that's why larger aperture telescopes may give higher resolutions, providing the seeing is very good. Now I talked about these little atmospheric cells. 
if the atmospheric cells at let's say four inches or five inches across and you're using a nine or 12 inch or 14 inch telescope then there are several cells in the line of sight and they're likely to all deflect the image in different directions so they get blurred if that is the case a smaller telescope could well be better so maybe depending on the seeing what telescope you want to use to image uh, will vary in size and it's only really when the seeing is very good that you can actually use more than uh, well i think i know damien peach once said nine and a quarter inches but i'm going to end up by showing you a picture he took uh, with a with his uh, 12 inch celestron so occasionally you can do better but certainly for visually quite often you'll see better with a smaller telescope so here's an example this is my 9.25 inch sc telescope we'll assume that you're using that rather nice aci 178 which has a 2.4 micron pixel size the focal length of that telescope you can see there is 2350 millimeters you can work out the angle subtended by each pixel first of all you take the number of microns and it's 2.4 in the case of that particular camera divide that by a thousand to convert that into centimeters divide that by the focal length and that gives you the angle subtended in radians you want to convert that to arc seconds if you multiply by 57.3 you convert it to degrees if you multiply that by 3600 you get arc seconds and the number comes out to 0.2 and that's very good because if you were hoping to get the 0.7 arc second resolution that maybe an eight inch or nine inch telescope could give you you're going to sample very well so that's good on the other hand i mentioned i've got a very nice six inch map newtonian and i'm now going to use the asi 294 as an example that's my deep space deep space uh, object imaging camera bigger pixel size 3.6 microns the focal length of the telescope is a lot less 760 millimeters you do the same sum and you find that each pixel subtends 1.25 arc seconds which is basically three times too poor so what you then do of course is you use a barlow lens factor of three is probably what you want they're typically two times i've got that 2.5 times teleview power mate that would work okay um, and i've got something else to say about that in a second but please note if you have to use a barlow lens with a small aperture telescope to make the image size large enough you'll need longer exposures and that reduces the effects of lucky imaging so that's one of the things you have to bear in mind which is why larger telescopes because they collect more light may well be better and another point to make is that the magnification of a barlow lens is partly determined by the distance of the lens from the sensor it also depends upon the um, strength of the um, concave lens so if you increase the distance of your barlow from the sensor with a small extender would be one and a quarter inch probably you can actually increase the magnification so you can actually tune a barlow if you want to so that's a help so i've got to click on next um now we're coming to the end um atmospheric dispersion is a real problem um this is the picture that you sometimes see if you take a picture say of saturn when it's at low elevation as it has been this summer the atmosphere splits it up into three colors a blue image higher up a green in the middle and a red below and the net result is the image you get as you see on the side there this is not my image just an example is blue fringed at the top and red fringed at the bottom now martin i think will show you how you can align the red green and blue channels of an image um, you can easily use registax or you can use one of the imaging programs uh, processing programs like um, photoshop but that helps however there's something better you can do i keep hitting the wrong little button and it's to use i think zwo sell most of them now it's an atmospheric dispersion corrector and it currently costs 124 pounds and the idea is you have two contra rotating prisms when they are lined up as you see in that top left image there's no effect and 
that's a star they're imaging there. You can you see it's blue, um, green in the middle and red below. Um, I, I showed you that picture of um, the moon um, when it was 42 hours and the earth shine. In fact, that particular night, Mercury was visible very close to the horizon. And I promise you, it looked exactly like that image in the top. So what you then do, you actually split apart those two little handles there that rotates the prisms. And then it basically tries to correct the dispersion caused by the atmosphere. And that's the one I've got in that picture. But I've noticed that if you go on the website now, the latest ones have a little bubble um, on them. Uh, and that's because you have to make the thing horizontal. And I think the best way to use it is not to directly look at, say, Jupiter and set it up by adjusting those two little levers. Find a star at exactly the same elevation. It's much easier then. You'll see something up like the top left. You'll adjust it till you get something like the bottom. And that you then use when you go across to Jupiter or Saturn. And that's a very useful device. It doesn't cost that much. And you can put it in front of your webcam. And here's a couple of examples. Uh, there's Saturn, another image uh, with no ADC and no RGB align. You can see the red and the blue there. If you align them in registacks, you do pretty well. But if you use the ADC, you do a lot better, as you see on that right hand image. And that's just the same. Here are images of Venus where the actual um, two prisms started off being just directly aligned, having no effect. As you increase the separation or the rotation of the prisms, you get to the point where Venus looks better. And then if you go further, can you see what was red at the top becomes blue and, and, and so on. So they are quite useful things and maybe Martin will talk about them as well. So finally, where and when might one get good seeing? Well, a quick test of the seeing is look at the stars. If they're twinkling quickly, the seeing will not be good. On the other hand, if they twinkle little and slowly, the seeing should be better. Again, look at the weather forecasts, and you see these lovely charts showing where the weather fronts are. Following a cold front, the air is likely to be turbulent. Preceding one, the air is warmer and more stable. Um, if you have cumulus clouds in the daytime, you can imagine they're all big up currents, aren't they, in the atmosphere. Seeing will be very poor for several hours after dark, assuming the cumulus clouds have actually faded away. And a nice indication of good seeing is with light winds, high altitude linear cirrus clouds. You don't want too many, but that will indicate quite good seeing conditions. So use the weather, map, weather maps and try and interpret what's going to happen. The wind direction has a, a role as well. If the air comes from the north, it's called polar maritime air. It tends to be very transparent, which is very good for deep sky imaging. But because it's turbulent, it's not so good for planetary imaging. On the other hand, if the air comes from the south and there's high pressure and you often get misty evenings and fog, the transparency can be very poor. On the other hand, it provides much better conditions for planetary imaging. So again, you can choose the right time. And of course, you can always take your telescope, have a look at Jupiter or whatever, and see how it looks. If it's moving around horribly, then probably it's not a good time to do some imaging. And finally, the location. This is a nice little diagram, and I think it's probably real. It was taken from someone who's in Cyprus. If you're at site A, preceding some mountains with laminar stable airflow from the ocean, you can get a pretty sharp image, as you see on the left. On the other hand, as the air has to go over the mountains and come down again, you get turbulent flow. And from, in this case, site B, the image is far worse. And it tends to be that the south of England is much better than the north in general, which is a bit sad for me because I live near Manchester. Um, I found this rather lovely topographic map of the UK with no rubbish on it at all. And it shows you what the land surface is like and the levels. And obviously, I think if you're down in the south coast, I think Damien lives at Selsey. I've been to some star parties on the Isle of Wight. 
because you're basically out adjacent to the sea, the airflow, if it's coming from anywhere like the, the southwest, could be quite smooth. So seeing will be good. Um, this little area up here is quite flat. <coughs> it's called the Cheshire Gap. And I live basically just before the hills here, the Macclesfield. And you might think that'd be quite good. The trouble is the air that comes in here is coming from the northwest. And so it tends to be polar maritime air, not so good. I think probably Anglesey would be good. And down here, particularly down here on the coast of Pembrokeshire. But finally, when I was looking at this, I noticed this lovely green area here. Now, this is the area that goes towards the wash. I suppose it might be called the fens, and it is very, very flat. So you might hope the seeing somewhere up here, that's King's Lynn about there, would be quite good. And it actually is. And there's a very nice article about atmospheric seeing on the web from a guy who lived in King's Lynn. And quite often, he had pretty good skies. And just to prove that, my final image, it's not mine, it's Damien Peach's, is an image he took of the moon from King's Lynn. You can see that. It was in 2013. And that was when Jupiter was way high in the sky. Um, it was about 64 degrees elevation, I found out when I went into Stellarium. It is using his trusty C14, and that just shows you that big telescopes can help. And there again, you can see Io and even some details on Io. So I hope that might give you a little bit of a heads up on how to go about setting up to do imaging. And Martin will now tell us precisely how to do it. So I'll come out of that if I can and show and stop sharing. I think that was about the right time, hopefully. Ian, thank you very much indeed. And it's uh, opened up the interesting topic of, of seeing. And I think all of us who have done any observing have noticed the seeing. You just can't get away from it, of course. And uh, in my early years, I spent to, uh, a few, uh, a fair bit of time at the Peak du Midi Observatory when I was oh, yes. working for the University of Manchester. And... That has legendary seeing, and the uh, University of Manchester put a, uh, a one-metre telescope up there to observe the moon. This is something that was done before the Apollo missions were in progress, and they wanted to get the, the US Air Force wanted to get really good images of the moon. So they actually paid to put a one-metre telescope on the Peak du Midi, which is still there. I'm told it went in the diplomatic bag. How you get a one metre telescope into a bag, I don't know. But in other words, um, it was it was done by uh, by sort of pulling strings rather than straight import and uh, all that sort of thing. So yeah. it's still there. But the point about the speaking to MIDI is that it's a, a mountain sticking up out of uh, quite a, a um, not a, I wouldn't say a flat area, but the main area of the Pyrenees are to one side and the air smooths out by the time it gets to the peak milli, to peak to midi, which is about nine and a half thousand feet high, 2.8 um, uh, to 2,800 meters. And it sticks into the, the laminar airflow, which is smoothed out by the time. And so that's an example. Um, the places like uh, the, the La Palma, you would yeah. expect to get good seeing as well. But also I'm told that being down by the sea is uh, is very good because the water vapour, this is for planetary seeing, not at all for deep sky imaging, but planetary seeing. I, I believe that the presence of water vapour in the atmosphere means that all those temperature variations you were talking about, the, the water vapour actually transfers heat from one cell to another. So it smooths out the temperature variations. And that is what gives rise to the good seeing rather than the, the lumpy seeing that we're so familiar with. It's a fascinating. Yeah. This one is, I forgot to say that I get Sky and Telescope. I don't think you can see my screen anymore. anymore. I'm probably not going to be visible. But anyway, in the, almost the latest issue, there's a picture by Damien of uh, Jupiter with three of its planets. And he's obviously gone up market because he did this, I think, remotely using a one meter telescope in Chile. Yeah. which is an ASA RC-1000, uh, using, in fact, the, uh, a very similar webcam to the one I mentioned, the mono one. And um, it just shows you what you can do. So uh, 
that's something we can all do. I think you can hire time on these, this telescope and uh, get some images to rival those taken by Damon. But it, I think it's better trying to do it yourself. And I'm sure Martin's going to tell us about that. There is something to, to your own images. I, I have got, uh, I did have a subscription to itelescope.net. And after a while, I, I didn't use it. I must use it again because my uh, the, I've paid them a lot of money and I haven't got the imaging out of it. So I must, I must actually get around to using it. But there is something to be said for going out into your own observatory and getting your own images in from your back garden compared with something that somebody else has set up. And OK, you press the button, you set up the parameters and so on. But I, I, I think doing it yourself is, is a, a really... Uh, has a lot more satisfaction yeah. to it. Well, as indeed I, I, must be drawing the, the planet as well. Yeah. Okay, well, that's good. Is, Sorry. I Someone think the is $100 an hour. So, yeah. uh, quite, quite expensive. I think because Damien does a lot of publicity work for it, then um, he gets it for free. So he's. And he, he charges an awful lot for his talks as well. <laughs> more than we do. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I, I want to talk to you about that, uh, Martin, at some point, because I have a possible thing that you might help us with in the okay. Isles of Silly. But uh, right. I'll, uh, I'll email you about that. I just wanted right. to pick up on a point with the humidity, though, that um, uh, if you exceptional nights are often had, if you look at uh, aeroplane contrails um, at medium height, if you get a long contrail, from not the very highest planes, but a sort of medium height plane, and the contrail is long and doesn't break up, that's a very good sign of higher humidity at uh, moderate levels and that the wind speeds at that sort of altitude are very even or very low. So I've often had, you know, taken that as a very good sign. If you look up and see very short contrails, it means the air is very cold and low humidity, and often the seeing is, is poor. So and often that cold air, as you say, has very little water vapour in it, so that's the time to do your deep sky observing. Yes. I, I use a, a radiative thermometer every night that I, I image, and I take the temperature of the sky and the temperature of the ground. And generally, there's a 30-degree difference between the ground temperature and the sky temperature, Sometimes it is as little as 10 degrees difference. Or if it's 10, 10 degrees or 20 degrees, you could be in for a good night. And, and what it means is there's a lot more humidity up there. Um, and that um, reduces the uh, radiative temperature, brings it closer to the uh, ground temperature. I must get one of those. Yeah. Sounds and also good. you were talking about twinkling. So if I'm deciding is the seeing going to be good, the contrails is a good thing, using a radiative thermometer is helpful, looking and seeing where the, um, the high speed winds are, the jet stream is, so there's a, a website and an app called windy.com, and if you look at the wind speeds at the 300 um, HPA level, um, then those sort of, that'll it's the wind speeds at that level that uh, you really want to be low to get good seeing. Um, and I look at twinkling, uh, like, like you say, it's the speed of the twinkling, but also the altitude. If stars are twinkling overhead, it's not going to be good. If, if they're just twinkling, you know, up to 30 degrees, and then it's sort of, they're all quite twinkle free above that. So it's the rate of twinkle and also the, uh, the altitude at which stars twinkle. But I have had some horrendous nights where the stars just don't twinkle at all because your eye, they're twinkling so rapidly that, you know, that, that the twinkling is effectively completely smoothed out. So, so interesting. just because they aren't twinkling doesn't, doesn't mean to see it's good, <laughs> but it can do. And there Very are good. different types of seeing, are there? We'll, we'll come to John oh, yeah. in a minute. Um, you, you get the, what I call the Wrigley seeing, where which sounds like what you were just talking about, where everything's shimmering, yeah. but it's on a very high frequency. And then you get the slow movement of planets, which really smears out any 
that was the, the killer for long exposure photographs on film because yes. what, what looked really sharp um, through a, through the telescope, through the eyepiece, and still you get with digital as well to some extent, what looks really sharp through the... Uh, through the it's just moving around, and so in yeah. a fraction of a second, it's just a mush, isn't it? Yes, very good. Uh, Are there any questions, I wonder? We've got John with his hand up. Hello, John. Hi. Um, all I was going to say is that the thing that people forget, of course, is the, I suppose you call it the dome seeing in professional terms, which is the hot air if you've got an observatory dome. Lots of people have things that generate heat inside them, like computers and things like that. And all that heat goes out through the slit in front of the telescope, disturbing the seeing. Now, I know on La Palma they had a big campaign to cool everything inside the dome because they reckon the seeing in the dome was far worse than it was outside. And they had to actually install oil coolers for the oil bearings on the telescope to get the oil down to ambient temperature. So all these computers you've got stuck in your dome are probably actually making your seeing quite a lot worse. And I don't know whether people measure this. I, don't, I, I agree with you. In fact, that's why my mount, which is actually quite a, a good one, uh, I got about half price though, um, is actually... <laughs> in my garden without any mm. cover except a duvet and I think two um, rain uh, proper canvas cover to, to, to keep it dry. And the good thing about this particular um, mount is that the electronics package, you know, the thing that controls everything, uh, unscrews and you can bring it inside mm. so that I don't have to leave the electronics outside. And I've had that out there for about four years now and it's still working perfectly. And of course, mm. you just take these things off. The thing is at the appropriate temperature, there's nothing around it. It does mean I've got to spend about 10 or 15 minutes taking out my laptop computer and all the drive controls and all the things you have to use uh, and obviously bring them in again at the end. So it's not so convenient as having an observatory, but probably I can do better. Mm. 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 Okay, we, uh, John Hendry, did you Thank have you. your... Uh, yes, yeah, yes. Well, there's a couple of things, actually. You know, I, I told, asked you some time about, had, had you heard as to why general seeing conditions haven't been as good as they were since, so say, 20, 2012? You right. know, I asked you about them and we said, but I mean, I've experienced things. But when I, I mean, I, originally, I'm, I don't do too much observing because um, I would I'd like to have a word with Ian a bit later because I've, I've, I've got cataracts and I still haven't had them done yet. And so that's affecting what I'm doing, what I'm, what I can see in that. But I've had my solar scope out recently. I've got a Conardo 60 mil double yeah. stack. And even when it's been, it seems like a perfectly clear blue sky day and you can perfectly see the sun, you can't see anything floating about in front of it. But when you look at it through the scope, it appears that, you know, the scene conditions aren't good. You know, there's things floating in front of it. And I spoke to someone else who's got a similar one and they said, because they've they've taken the front um, blocking filters off, you know, to enhance what they can do. Because I mean, you've got the two stacking filters, so you can vary what you see, can't you? Yes, yes, yes. Um, so, and he said he's taken the front one off to improve the view because the seeing conditions have been so poor. Well, I don't know. I've actually got a double stack lunt, uh, and I have the best image I've ever seen of the sun was through a double stacked 60 millimeter Coronado, like the one you've got, but that was actually in the Sahara Desert. Yeah. Uh, and I've just never seen, and that was when the last solar maxima was. But things are yeah. getting more interesting. Um, for a long time, there was absolutely nothing to see, but now we are beginning to see some things. I, 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 I don't quite know why taking the second ethyl on off makes things better, but I can't say that it won't. But anyway, no. best of luck. At no. least but I, mean, we can... I mean, I had it out there, I mean, it was, it was just when I retired back in 2012 when I when I was off. So because I've got an enclosed garden and I've got one of those ioptron mounts, they can set it up in daylight, you know, and uh, yeah. you know, I've got to use point it south. And, you know, it's not like trying to do it, obviously, setting it up, you know, if you've got a polar aligned one. Um, and I set it up early in the day, about nine o'clock, when I was messing about doing other things. And I could set it up to keep having a look at it while I was doing other things. And it stayed on track the whole day. And seeing conditions were perfect. And I mean, I've got a fantastic views. And as I say, ever since, you know, and gradually since then, the seeing conditions have generally deteriorated. You might get the odd good day, but I mean, 
seeing conditions don't seem to be anywhere near as good as they were then. Well, uh, maybe true. I honestly don't know. Martin, I'm sure, has kept an eye on the sky a lot more than I have. Well, having a, having a regularly imaged at night, I mean, this isn't the daytime, but at night since 2005, I, I wouldn't say it's particularly, you know, it's up and down. No, you, uh, you can't just go out and go, oh, oh, it's bad. You need to look at where the jet stream is. You need to be aware of wind speeds. You need to be aware of where high pressure systems are. I know that um, Alexandra, who does um, fantastic solar imaging, will wait until a high pressure arrives and three days into the arrival of a high pressure system, that's when the best solar imaging is to be done. And, you know, it's almost, uh, you know, it's almost yeah. guaranteed. Three yeah. days into a high pressure, things will have settled down. You've got to create an inversion layer and then that steadies things. I mean, the daytime, daytime seeing is a, is a whole different yeah. game to nighttime seeing. Yeah. And I've only scratched the surface. So, you know, I do some Mercury imaging and Venus imaging, but solar imaging, yeah, it's a whole, yeah. I learn yeah. a whole different um, approach really. And image early in the morning before yeah. it's not hot, you know, maybe yeah. an hour yeah. or two after sunrise, um, if you're doing solar stuff, because yeah. things heat up, the ground heats up, the ground gets hot, Convection currents kick off, you know, depends yeah. so much on what your surrounding is like. Um, some people will spray hose down paving in front of the telescope to cool it down, reduce the heat yeah. that's in there and reduce convection currents. There's all sorts of things you can do. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I had my set up on the, on the, on the lawn, on the grass, so it wasn't a case of, you know, fog, you see, so, so it was there. But it's just, and I've taken it out to other places, but it's, no, it's just one of those things. Another thing was, was to them, Ian, about the cataracts. I mean, one thing I don't know, just when I tried to describe to the optics what I can see, and I couldn't believe it. They see, because I mean, it seems to me that, because you, you know, obviously, if you like, you turn the monitor for your TV on, you usually get usually a red light. If I take my glasses off, I can see a ring of lights around where the light should be. In other words, it appears as though the cataract is gravitationally lensing the. Um, <laughs> the light, one light I can see, so I'm seeing a ring of red lights around where you should just see one light. Now, look, we, we probably were off topic, but yes, um, another good thing is when you've had them done is you probably will see stars fainter by about at least half a magnitude, yeah, which is yeah. great. Um, so go ahead and get them done. Uh, it, I was heavily myopic. Now I've got perfect vision distance, but, but I need to have glasses for my computer or for reading. And my wife laughs at me. Well, anyway. Well, I, I mean, I used to have very good eyesight. I mean, I could read things a lot, a lot fainter than other people could, well into my 40s. And then I needed reading glasses. And obviously then I had to have glasses for all the time. And of course, then the, these cataracts are coming on. I mean, it's worse in the left eye than the right eye. But I mean, I mean, I couldn't believe it. That I said, you mean to tell me no one else has ever driven you an drawn you an image, you know, to opticians and even to the consultants down at Brooks Hospital? that no one's actually drawn you a picture of what you can actually see. I said, I can't believe that. Okay. Well, no, look, we better move on. Yeah, because... I'd like to give yeah, everyone yeah, yeah, a bit yeah, of a yeah, break. And yeah. Yeah, but anyway, I'll ask one last question from John Morrell very quickly, if you could, John. Yeah, I was just going to say the image behind me um, is actually during the transit of Mercury. Yeah. And there was actually this very strange phenomena went across, which was actually some sort of atmospheric disper distortion mm -hmm. it actually drifted across and actually mercury totally disappeared which shows how bad it was Good Lord. for about two minutes and what it was was not clear whether it was related to aircraft controls there was very very strange winds up high because i've got an image later on where there's the aircraft controls were in big s shapes down the down the sky so it was obviously something very odd that 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 day and we also actually observed that above them, an old abandoned aircraft um, runway. That wasn't a good idea with hot tarmac either. Yeah, that right. didn't seem much good. 
Okay, I'm going to call the discussion to a close now, and we have got a, a five-minute break, if you will, um, and then Ian will, uh, Martin will take on. Um, and Martin has said that he is happy to have the audience visible. So if people want to keep their uh, their, their monitors on, that's fine with Martin. The camera's on, but please mute yourself so that the rattle of teacups and all that sort of thing. That doesn't come over. So um, we, we'll give you a five minute break now. Just um, share the screen with a uh, with a, a, a blank screen. There we go. Uh, and so be back in five minutes at 10 past four. Shall I share my screen then, Robin? Yeah. By, yeah, yeah. OK, well, um, I'll screen. stop sharing mine then, and you can share yours. Okay. We'll leave it on that. You've got the double click to enter full screen mode business that Ian had was as well. Don't mm -hmm. understand that. What well, that's showing now? Uh, I can't see your screen yet. I Just the. Uh... My screen sharing is paused. What is that? Hmm. <laughs> okay, well, let's, let me just do that again. I don't know what's going on there. Screen sharing is paused. What the... Let me just check my options for screen. You just uh... you close some of these windows down. Right, let's try again. Ah, right. You're there. Yes. Yes, that's it. Yep. So, um, right, right, it's seven minutes past four. So I'll just go and get a drink. And then if you'd like to leave that on the screen, then I'll start you in a few minutes time.
Hi there, Martin. Hi. Okay, right. Well, it's okay. time to go. And uh, just remind people that you, well, I'll, I'll keep my video on. Okay. And uh, anybody else who wishes to appear in person is very welcome to do so, so yeah. that we yeah. have some 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 audience uh, evidence yeah. of an audience. It does, it, does make, it does make it much easier. It's quite difficult to talk to a completely blank screen. As far as you are concerned, the world might have ended and you don't know. <laughs> You're just carrying on talking. Well, Ian's got a cup of tea from Judy. So, uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. Right, okay, off you go. So this is a talk about high resolution planetary imaging. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit about um, the principles of high res planetary imaging and talk about some of the things that will help you get to good images if you want to have a go or improve your imaging uh, techniques and results if you're already, if you're already doing it. I mean, there will be some overlap with what Ian has already talked about, and there will be some things that Ian has suggested I'm going to talk about that, unfortunately, I haven't had time to put in here. I mean, really, I need a, a whole day to cover the subject, you know, even at a, a sort of a moderate level. But uh, anyway, that's the way it goes. OK, so. Um, oh. So we go. Right. So how do you best image the planets? Well, we've talked about seeing and you to get the finest detail, you need good seeing, you need steady atmosphere. A uh, large telescope uh, helps uh, with a high resolution as a result of the larger aperture and high quality optics. Um, you also need to talk how to um, have a high magnification so that the details not lost in the coarseness of the camera pixels. You don't want to have one pixel um, of the camera covering um, detail that the telescope is producing in the focal plane, um, you will just lose resolution. So you need to match the camera, the camera pixel size to the, um, the, um, the diffraction level produced by the telescope. And you need short exposures to reduce the smearing caused by the movement of the atmosphere. Um, so what about single frame imaging? So for, you know, many years, um, the way to obtain images was to take photographs, you know, with, um, put a, put a camera, at the, at the focal plane of the telescope, open the shutter, short exposure. Um, what was that like? So I want, I want to talk about that, explore that as a lead on to um, digital video imaging. So here are some pictures taken by Horace Stahl of Luton with a quite a large telescope, 39 centimeter scope. And these are some of the best planetary photos ever taken. Um, quite shocking really. Um, and you can see far more at the eyepiece of a telescope like that. Horace Stahl was a famed optician um, produced superb optics, so um, his his telescope would have been of uh, unimpeachable quality. Um, but these are the best photos that he was able to take. Um, and here is the Hale telescope, two hundred inch Hale telescope, a huge scope. Um, and there's the pic the MIDI scope in 1988, picture of Jupiter. Um, you know in at a superb location, a massive telescope with massive light gathering capabilities on a very bright planet, Jupiter, and that's about as good as you can get. So obviously you were satisfying the good seeing, the pick the MIDI telescope. You've got large high quality telescopes and um, you've matched the magnification to the grain size on the film. But the problem is that the exposures were not short. And so that last item there, you're not satisfying. Um, and the, the, the light had to be spread out over quite a large area because of the grain size. 
that spreads out the light and it makes the exposure times excessively long and you get atmospheric blurring. Even on very still nights, you will get some movement. There's never, I've never come across a night where the image is just completely static. It never is like that. So the Jupiter image there, Forestall, that was a one second exposure. The Saturn image was a three second exposure. Um, and that was on um, very fine grained Kodak Plus X film. And that was hypered to give, um, to massively increase, increase the sensitivity of the film. Um, so the resolution isn't great and they're very noisy. So what's the problem? So I want to talk a bit now, a bit now about um, a thing called shot noise. So light's got a dual nature. In some circumstances, you can think of it as a wave, acting like a wave uh, with diffraction and things like that. Um, in other circumstances, it can be best regarded as acting like a particle. We call that a photon. So in low light conditions where light is limited, it's better to think of it like uh, a stream of particles coming in and they arrive at random intervals. So the number that you collect at each pixel in a given time varies because they're coming in randomly. And that variation is called shot noise. So here's an image of the full moon rising over the Alps from um, a place in Switzerland that I went to a few years ago. Fantastic. It was a fantastic sight to see the full moon rising. And I thought I'll take a photo of that on my phone and was really disappointed when that came out because it's just so noisy. And that's because there wasn't a lot of light and I've got a tiny lens on the, on the camera phone. Uh, and so I wasn't gathering much light. Um, and that's because um, the, uh, when you have not much light, the ratio of the, no of the shot noise to the actual signal is low. As you increase the number of photons captured by the pixel, the ratio of the two improves. And actually, there's a simple formula to calculate the shot noise, and it's just the square root of the number of photons. So in dim conditions, say you've got 100 photons gathered by the pixels, you'll have square root of 100, you'll have 10 photons of noise and 100 photons of signal. So that's 10 to one. But if you increase it to 10,000 photons, now the shock noise is root of 10,000, which is 100. And the ratio now is 100 to one. So it's 10 times better. So if you want to reduce the impact of the noise, you need to increase the number of photons gathered. So as, as you gather more photons, noise relative noise decreases. But obviously in that example there, 100 photons, you've got 10 photons of noise and 10,000 photons, you've got 100 photons of noise. You've got more noise in the second example, you've got 10 times as much noise. It's not less noisy, it's just that the ratio of the noise to the signal is significantly improved. And the fundamental issue with single frame imaging is there's just not enough light. You need more light. So if you had more light, you could have shorter exposures and they wouldn't suffer so much from noise. And the trouble with noise is you can't do any stretching or contrast boosting because all it will do is just boost the noise. So here's um, one of the videos that I showed earlier of Jupiter on a good night, you know, very good night, not moving around much. You can see detail in the video there. And here on the left hand side, you've got the single best frame from that video. These are 21 millisecond frames. And what I've done is I've taken that. So that's like a single shot with a, with a digital camera, there you go. And then I stretch it to try and bring out the detail. And that's what happens on the right hand side. It just completely falls apart and you don't 
there's no benefit at all in doing that because the image is just way too noisy. However, the answer is, how can you get long exposures and short, so you want a long exposure to gather a lot of light and reduce the noise, but you don't want a long exposure because it'll cause, it'll cause movement smearing. So how do you get out of that hole? How is there a way of having individual short exposures and having a long exposure? Well, the answer is by combining images, combining lots of short images to make one image and effectively adding add, by adding things together, if you had um, a minute's worth of short exposures, adding them all together, effectively it's a one minute exposure, but each exposure is very short and that freezes the seeing. So that's what lucky imaging that uh, Ian referred to is all about. It's all about taking lots of short exposures um, and adding them together. And that then allows you to stretch it. And then no other method for planetary um, imaging comes close in terms of accuracy and the level of detail recorded. So here we are. Here's the Pick the Midi image, 1988, one of the best images of Jupiter, the photographs of Jupiter. And here we are in 2017 with this, exactly the same telescope with uh, lucky imaging, with um, just a fairly simple ASI camera on there. And the levels of detail are just staggering on that image, absolutely staggering. So that's taken by a, a, a consortium of uh, amateur astronomers, including uh, Damien. <clears throat> so uh, that's the principle of it is to take lots of short exposures, combine them together, that reduces the noise and it averages out the atmospheric movement because if you take lots of shots, the atmosphere is moving things around, but on average, things, one part of the planet doesn't drift out of the field of view, it stays in the same place. All the features on average are in the same place. So if you average them out, everything's in the right place. It's just that they, they might be um, a bit bloated. Also, if you do that and gather lots of frames, you can just throw away the worst ones, just chuck away all the, the most smeared ones and the most blurry ones and keep the best ones. So if you, if you only take one thing away from this talk, that thing should be that with digital planetary imaging, it's actually a very long exposure made up of many short exposures. So how does it work? And Ian's covered some of this already. Set up your scope. Here's a planetary imaging camera and you take a long video with multiple frames and you combine them together. Um, your evening's work is then combined into a single final image. And there's the setup with a scope tracking you've got a, a barlow there filter wheel a video camera and and you generally you're recording live it's lots of data so you don't record it in the camera and then download it later it's far too much you need to download it live to a laptop because you you're talking potentially of many gigabytes you know typically if i'm imaging i will record about 30 gigabytes of data uh, on, a, on a session. So here's my setup. Um, I use two telescopes. This is my 222 millimeter scope, home built on a home built equatorial tracking platform there. Um, that's in my pathway up my back garden. I don't have an observatory, so I don't have these dome problems and it allows me to set my scope up at different locations to get around obstacles like trees and houses and you know get an optimum observing posi position. And then here's my larger scope, again, home built, um, 200, uh, 444 millimeter Dobsonian, um, 
that I've had since 1993. So that's uh, 28 years now and uh, never used it off the planetary imaging until 2013. Decided to give it a go and haven't looked back since. So again, that's halfway up my garden. And I use this tracking platform. Uh, track These sort of tracking platforms are quite odd things. They don't have a real axis, they have a virtual axis. Um, they rotate in a strange way, but once they're set up, anything you put on that platform will follow the stars um, for 80 minutes. Um, and then you've got to reset it. But uh, very simple, extremely stable. Um, I've put a lot of work into reducing the vibration of the motor, because that's one of the, the big uh, the big bugbears in planetary imaging is vibration from the drive motor, and many people don't realise that, but I'll come on to that. Um, and here are some of my first results, Mars in 2005 uh, and Jupiter in 2006. So that's when I started, um, and the tracking platform was built specifically with the apparition of Mars, being able to take images of Mars in mind. And here's a particularly nice one taken with a 222 millimeter showing a, a huge uh, north polar region at the bottom there and all the lovely crinkly uh, part of Mars that I love at the top there, uh, the Caprates region and the Valles Marinaris, absolutely love that area. Okay, so um, let's talk a bit more about um, how it all works, how, how it all comes together, uh, digital video imaging, and it's it's a blend of hardware and software all working together, the camera, the stacking software, the telescope. And for me, that's a big appeal of planetary imaging is it just calls up so many different areas of, that you've be, got to develop expertise in, you know, on, uh, on weather, atmosphere, optics, image processing, you know, aesthetics, mechanics, all sorts of stuff that you've got to master, really. Uh, not, not that it's, if you don't, you get rubbish results, but just you can take it a long way, you know, by tackling all these things, all the things that come into play. Okay, so what I want to do now is talk about a, a, a uh, a video and show you how I would process a video. I hope this works. Okay, so here we have this video that we saw just recently. Um, there's the video of Jupiter, quite a good video. The um, uh, I'm going to now talk about what what I would do with the recorded video. So let's assume you've got a you've got a decent video. How, how the hell do you turn that into a single image? So you have a piece of software, a lot of all the software that I use, apart from my image, my final image processing software is free. So I, um, there's a program called AutoStackert. And what that does is it takes the video and splits it into individual frames and then puts them in quality order. So it allows you to throw away the worst ones. So in this example, we're keeping the best 50%. So here's the video. There's the worst frame on the right-hand side. And there's the best frame on the left-hand side. And about halfway through, it's about halfway in between the good and the bad. So we, the software allows you to reject the most blurred ones and keep the best ones. And what it does then is it takes all the frames so we've got 881 frames and they're all in a slightly different position on screen and the software not only sorts them it then lines them all up on top of one another highly accurately and it produces this average image and it then becomes a stacked image um, and the noise is effectively reduced so here we are. So we've taken 881 frames and added them together. And on the right hand side, we've got this averaged image. 
and you look at that and you say, well, that's not very good, is it? That's no better than, you know, the best is the best frame better than that. Okay, it's less noisy, but it's not really any sharper, is it? But what it does is it allows you to contrast boost it without it falling apart. Um, I should say that the alignment now has got to, the abilities to align are so refined that not only will it just move the center of the planet to lie over the center of the planet of the neighboring frames, but it will also look at the whole frame and break it down into individual sections. And you may find that there's one frame and the left-hand side of the planet sharp and the right-hand side isn't. And the software now will recognize that and keep the good part on the left-hand side and chuck away the bad part on the right hand side. And this is called multi point align. So on the right hand side, you see a picture of Mars, not a potato, but Mars just going through various distortions. And the multi point align will keep track of all that wobbliness and end up giving you the correctly shaped planet. And how it does it is amazing, you know. You've got this wobbly jelly mass and you think, well, how does it know that the planet's round or how does it know that the rings of Saturn are elliptical? But that's how they end up. It's uh, it's incredible. Um, so I'm now going to attempt to show you that stacking process. So let me I think I've got to stop sharing here and then reshare. This up. Can you see that? Can you see auto stacker? stacker yes. Uh, yeah. There, there, it's got all the frames over it. Yeah. Is that the live one? Yeah. Good. Okay. So this is a program called auto stacker. So it comes in two boxes here and here. Um, I have to share my whole desktop, I think, for this to work. Um, and you import the video. And there it is on the left hand side. And you've got a slider. At Hang the on, top. Martin. I think we can only see one image of Jupiter at the moment. And okay. I sort of saw a little bit of a frame. It's not the full screen, it's only one, one box. Okay, let me, let me try that again. Uh, I need to share my whole screen, don't I? Ah, that looks like it. Uh, no, that's the that's the other slide, isn't it? And let's try again. New share. I would have thought it was. Try again. So, what do you see there? Do you see the right hand side of Auto Stacker? Yes and not the left hand side. Yes. Okay, well, let's do this in. So you've got this set up here. Um, yeah, your moved. problem is you've got to screen, share screen is not share screen at all, it's share window. And you've got two windows. I think and that's I close the, the uh, Let me close the other window. So is it just sharing the window? It's just sharing a single window. Which is the... my, how do I share my desktop then? Uh... <laughs> That's what I want to do. Pass. Um... It's got screen, but it's not. I need to. Ah, now, oh. yeah, I've got your desktop now. You can see right. you've got your starry background and two oh, okay. windows. Okay, good. Right. So, um, so I've opened that video. 
And if I move the slider, hopefully you can see the planet moving and changing, changing brightness. There might be a bit of cloud moving around, but you can see the planet. We can. Okay. So the first thing you do with this is to, so it's set up on planet. Surface mode, it would be for the, the moon or something like that. And then there are various settings in here. I won't go into great detail, but one thing you can play around with is this noise setting, what's called noise robust. And generally what I do is I set that to how noisy I think the image is, which it's not too noisy. So set it to something like four, and then you just analyze it. And it goes through, sorts through the frames and puts them in quality order. So now it's got the best ones on the left-hand side. So I'm gonna move the slider from the left to the right, and it will go from the best frame, get worse and worse and worse until you get to the fuzziest frame. So there you can see lots of little spots and things, and over this end you can't, it's much fuzzier. So that's quite a good sort there. So I'm pleased with that. And then you divide it into all the individual sections. You then say, well, how, what, what percentage would you like to choose? So you can choose, you can choose 30% and 15%. You can choose whatever percentages you want to stack. So I've chosen to pick 30% and 15%, and it will do two stacks, one with the best 30%, and one with the best 15%. And you just hit the stack button. So then it goes through and very quickly, it sorts them and stacks the best 30% and the best 15%. And over here, you can see you've got RGB align ticked and it lines up the red image the blue image and the green image automatically and you end up with a stacked image so it's done the 30 the 30 percent and now it's doing the 15 percent and we're done okay so i'm now going to go back to yeah is that an i7 computer because it was very quick um, I'm not sure. I don't know. It's, it's quite an old computer. It's about 10 years old, I think. Mean. Oh, wow. Impressive. Yeah. But I've got a quite, I've got a solid state hard drive in there and uh, quite a lot of memory. And that really helps. So um, we'll come back to, we'll, we'll just go back to the presentation briefly. Um, how can I get rid of, that's blocking the view at the moment, isn't it? Oh, I can get that out. There we are. Looks okay. Oh, is it okay? Right. So, so we've stacked the best frames. That's reduced the noise. It's averaged out the atmospheric turbulence, thrown away the worst frames, and you can then process that and stretch it without it falling apart. So now, now we've reduced the noise. You can boost the contrast and end up with the image on the right hand side which is much better than the image on the left-hand side. Um, so let's, let's go back and have a look at that. So what we need to do is to open a different program. So with this game, you have lots of different programs that do different things. And one of the most popular ways of processing an image is to use a program called Registax that also does all the stacking and quality sorting, but it's just nowhere near as elegant as AutoStacker. But at the back end of it, it's got this um, uh, processing um, module on it that works very well. So let me just find that. Uh, program, just find my file. 
Twitch. Yeah. So I've done 620 planetary imaging sessions now. So if I go back to 2016, I think it's that one. There we are. So here are, so this is the 15% um, image. And here we have it imported into Registax. So that's the stacked image. Um, it's the best 15%. So you've got a few hundred images there um, and it's nice and smooth and not very noisy. And you can magically transform it by just moving these sliders that sharpen it up. And you can see all this fine detail starting to appear. Oops. But there's also a feature in there, which is to smooth out the noise a bit. And this denoise will allow you to soften it a bit and smooth it and allow you to end up with a smooth but sharp image. So you get something like that and there's various other settings that you can do. So that's the basic principle. Um, let's now go back to presentation. So here we are um, with our wavelet processed image. Um, there is some noise in there still, so you would like to combine more, um, but it's loads better. There's the single frame and we, that, that we stretched and it just shows that you couldn't do any stretching on it at all without the image completely falling apart. But here, when you've got lots of frames together, it works beautifully. Um, now, as I said, the noise, the, the relative noise goes with the square root of the total number of exposures. So if you've got four times the exposure, um, it effectively gives half the shot noise or it, 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 it doubles the signal to noise ratio. So what you want to do is you want uh, more exposures. You don't necessarily want more frames if they're shorter, you just want more accumulated exposure time. You want more photons gathered, and that allows you to end up with a smoother image. So at the bottom there, you can see that's one frame. Then I've got 10 frames stacked, so that's 10 times the amount of time. And on the right-hand side, you've got 100 frames. So the signal to noise on the right-hand side where you've got 100 frames, there's 100 times as many photons will be 10 times better than the one on the left hand side. And shot noise, shot noise reduction is the key to unlocking planetary image detail lost due to the turbulence of the atmosphere. You always want more data and that's one of the big advantages of a bigger scope. Yes, it's got higher resolution, but the light gathering power allows you to gather more photons and reduce the shot noise and allow you to stretch it more and bring out the, the contrast. Um, you can not throw away so many frames. Um, so here's a, a schematic, keep all the frames. So here are the options, keep all the frames, the good, the bad and the ugly, 100%, we'll sack all those. You have a nice long accumulated time or you could use a very, only the very, very best frames, the best 1% of frames, and you'd have a very short accumulated time. Now that improves the quality by doing that. So you get the very best frames, but it increases the total noise on the stack because your accumulated time is much less. So here is the, pro, the image that we process, or an image that we processed of, uh, of Saturn. Here we've stacked everything, been completely um, non-discriminatory. We've just stacked everything. That's one video, 60 seconds, everything. Down here on the bottom right-hand side, 
we've picked the very best 5%. And you can see the level of detail in there is incredible, but it's really noisy. And there's a, a balance to be struck between lower noise and better detail. And it's probably around the 20% mark, you know, when you get to 10%, 5%, the noise levels there are really quite objectionable. Um, but at the 20%, you've got plenty of detail and not too much noise. So um, there are the extremes, best 80% blurry, low noise, 3% details lost in the noise, probably about 20% is a good compromise. Um, and that's the final processed image of Jupiter. Um, from not just that video, but um, Ian alluded to it. There's a program called WinDupos, and what that does is it allows you to combine videos. Well, why can't you just take several videos, take the outputs, and just put them on top of one another? And the problem with that is that Jupiter rotates very quickly, and if you do that, it will just be smeared by the rotation of the planet. But WinDupos, this freeware program, WinDupos, allows you to derotate the planet. It will, it will effectively shift all the pixels to a common time. So you can dramatically extend the imaging window. So normally for Jupiter, the imaging window is about between one and three minutes. Um, and after that, it's moved too much. So forget it. You know, you've got to do your red, your green, your blue, if you're doing um, color imaging through filters, um, or you've got three minutes with a color camera and that's it. But having this WinDupos derotation is fantastic because it allows you to record videos over 20 minutes or so, and then derotate them to a middle time and everything all lines up beautifully and you've extended your, you've got a, you know, a much longer accumulated exposure time. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk about, um, I thought it'd be quite good to do 11 things to improve your planetary images. Now, a lot of these things you won't hear about from other people, but they're things that I've gathered through personal experimentation and experience, some are obvious. So Ian talked about image scale. And one thing that amateurs who start off in planetary imaging do is use way too small an image scale. So their, their planets are tiny um, and they're not making the best of the pixels in the camera. So um, here's an image of Jupiter and on the same night with um, a different camera, got a much larger image scale, and I've ended up with that. What you need to do is to match your camera pixel size to your telescope resolution. Um, how do you do that? Um, there's a very simple rule of thumb that you can follow, and that's for a mono camera. So that's a camera that doesn't have a color matrix in front of it, a simple um, mono camera. If you pick an F ratio for your Barlow and telescope combination, that is three to five times the pixel size in microns, or four to seven times the pixel size in microns for a one shot color camera, you will satisfy the Nyquist criterion and you will have three pixels across the smallest diffraction feature that you're telescope can produce. So here's an interesting image. This is Mars imaged um, back in 2019, I think, um, and Aldabaran imaged uh, exactly with the same telescope, with the same camera, just one uh, a bit later than the other, it didn't change anything in the setup. So you can see there a star, Aldabaran, with the first ring, you can see the airy disk in the center, um, and you can even see the second diffraction ring outside the first diffraction ring. They're at the same image scale. So you can see the features on Mars 
you know, you've got small features on Mars there that are being picked up that are smaller than the diffract than the airy disk on uh, for Aldebaran. And this is the this is what you're aiming to do. Anything that destroys the um, the airy disk and distorts that is going to impact your your um, your ability to resolve fine details on the planet. And what you want to do is you want to have three pixels to cover what's called the doors limit, which is about twice the size of the airy disk. So you can see a reasonable match between the smallest features on the Mars image and about half the airy disk size there. Star test your Barlow. So, um, not all Barlows are created equal, um, and some are much better than others. Um, there is a simple way of testing your whole optical system, including your Barlow, and that is to do put a star just a little bit out of focus. Um, and if you put a star out of focus, it, it grows into a disc and you see rings in it. Now, if you put the eyepiece just a little bit inside focus, and then put it the same way, just the other way, outside of focus, and they look the same, you can celebrate because that means if they, if they are exactly the same, you've got a perfect optical system. I've never seen a telescope that's done that in all the telescopes I've looked through. I've never seen it identical inside and outside. They're always different. Um, and the bigger the difference, then the, the less perfect the telescope system. So in this image, I've got, so I've done this through webcam imaging, through digital video imaging in the same way as imaging the planets. So we've got at the start, we've got nine waves and you can see um, this is the, the star image at defocused and they're fairly similar inside and outside of focus. But I put uh, two times mead apochromatic Barlow in and absolutely terrible. So I reckon this was about um, a third wave, worse than a third wave, that Barlow. Um, absolutely terrible. So it's effectively highly overcorrected. Um, and very different inside and outside focus. A three times Teleview Barlow also is um, got significant um, overcorrection. Um, there's a, a simple way of remembering um, remembering which way round this is. If you outside starts with an O, overcorrection starts with an O that looks like an O. So outside of focus, that's like a number O or letter O. And that's the way, that's a simple way to remember it. If you, if you defocus outside focus and it, you've got a bright ring on the outside and then inside focus, all the light is it towards the middle, then your telescope system is overcorrected. And so you can see here with the the three times Teleview Barlow, which is a premium Barlow, it's overcorrected. And you can see on the five times PowerMate, it's overcorrected as well. Um, and then I've done a test at the end. At the end of the test, I've then repeated the whole thing. Now, what are these at the bottom? At the bottom, there's a piece of freeware called Aberrator, and it allows you to model different degrees of over and under correction or other features and work out what the degree of error is. So what this is saying is that three times Barlow is about a quarter of a wave and the five times power mate is about a fifth of a wave. So you have to consider that you, you could have the most perfect mirror and spend thousands and thousands on a you know absolutely perfectly made mirror and then you put a a Barlow in the front and you end up with a third wave uh, system. So you, 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 it's well worth star testing your Barlow. Stop your scoop, 
scope cooling below ambient temperature. So yes, you've let your scope cool down. You've had it out, you know, for several hours. You've got a fan on the mirror, um, and you look through the eyepiece. You throw the star out of focus. You see all these currents swirling around inside your telescope. What's going on? Well, um, a lot. Not a lot of people are aware of a thing called reverse tube currents and uh, oh, sorry inverse tube currents and that is where the top of the telescope that sees the cold night sky cools down well below ambient um cools down well below ambient how can it do that how can it how can it be colder at the top of the telescope than the bottom of the telescope well, as i said earlier um if you measure the radiative temperature of the night sky uh, it's typically about minus 30 degrees so the top of the telescope sees that very cold sky um, and wants to cool down to minus 30 degrees. It's prevented from doing so by the warm air around it that the, the whole telescope is bathed in, but it can be several degrees below the bottom of the telescope. So here's a setup that I did a few years ago with different materials under a cold night sky. And here you see the table of the results. So that was cooling for two hours and you can see black plastic, two and a half degrees below the ambient temperature, black nylon, two and a half degrees below ambient. There's dewing on those, they're below the dew point and they've got all wet. The luminized mylar was only a degree below ambient, aluminium kitchen foil, nice and shiny, half a degree. So people ask me, why, that, why on earth have you got Baker foil all over your telescopes? And that's the reason. It reduces tube currents and it dramatically improves the resolution of the telescope and it stops it dewing up and it stops it getting really wet as well. So there's lots of benefits to doing that. And you can simply do it with um, one of these emergency foil blankets. Just wrap stuff in that, a couple of uh, tent, um, clothes pegs at the bottom to clip it together. Job done. Okay, uh, here's a top tip. Um, with shot noise, what matters is the total accumulated exposure time, as I said. Now, you can pick high gain and short exposures. So if you have a, if you boost the gain up, the image becomes brighter and you can drop the exposures and you can have lots of frames or you can go to the other extreme and you can have a low gain and much longer exposures. So if you lower the gain, it'll get dimmer. So you lengthen the exposure and you'll get fewer frames, but it doesn't matter. Don't agonize about, oh, should I have a high gain and short exposure or low gain and long exposure? What matters from the point of view of shot noise is the total accumulated time um, and they should be both the same as long as it's not your camera's not running so fast that you can't get the data down the line fast enough and it uh, it throttles back so here's an image of saturn right on the left hand side we've got best frame from a two minute recording we've got 60 millisecond exposure and again of 14 times and we process it all up and we end up with, we've decided to pick the best 30% of 2000 frames in total, and you end up with that. Okay, so that's the, the long exposure, um, low gain mode. And then we'll do the high gain, short exposure. Oh my God, look at that frame on the left-hand side. That's so noisy, I really don't like that. Don't worry about it, it doesn't matter. What matters is what it's like in the stack on the right hand side. So again, now you've got it's exactly the same accumulated exposure time. You've got a quarter of the exposure, but you've got four times as many frames. So that makes up for the shorter exposure. And although the individual frames are noisy, when you add them together, it works out the same. So let's see how that compares. There we go. So two modes. In both cases, you've got an accumulated exposure time of 36 seconds. One's on the left is with the short exposure, 
and the high gain, the one on the right with the long exposure and the um, low gain, same accumulated, same level of noise, I'd go for the one on the left, much higher detail. And that's because you've got shorter exposures, so you get less smearing. So go for, don't be afraid of using too high a gain. Experiment, bump the gain up, go for shorter exposures, but keep, the, uh, keep an eye on whether or not your, your, your data rates are so high that you're, um, you're losing frames. You don't want to lose frames. You don't want to lose accumulated exposure time. But at 15 milliseconds, that's very unlikely. You know, if you were down at one millisecond, then, you know, maybe a frame rate would be so high that uh, you'd be losing frames. So top tip, push, go, go for higher gain. I've often had, I've had far more problems from using too low a gain and not enough noise in the image than using too high a gain. Um, and as an example, here is uh, Uranus. That's a single frame. Um, of a video of the planet Uranus. Oh, it plays, good, look, there we go. So that's Uranus, lovely, isn't it? So really noisy frames. Individual frames are horrendous and it looks like a globular cluster, doesn't look like a planet at all. But if you gather enough of those, and this is about 10 minutes, let me just see how. So you've got a 10 millisecond exposure and that's uh, an ASI 290 camera with an IR filter. And let's just stop that. And there it is processed. So that's where I've added thousands of frames together and ended up with this image of Uranus. Um, and suddenly there's all this detail and the signal to noise is dramatically better. So don't worry about the individual frames. What matters is what it's like in the stack. Okay. okay. Check your motor drive vibration. So um, there's a simple way of checking your, your mount and your, um, your, your whole mount and telescope system from the point of view of vibration. Um, I was first made painfully aware of this on my equatorial platform when I was imaging uh, Saturn and the rings were edge on. And um, I, Saturn had drifted to one side of the field of view and I switched the, um, the tracking motor off temporarily and suddenly it became much sharper. And I thought, that's not supposed to happen. I can't feel any vibration through the platform. Um, what's going on? So I decided to take a thousand frames with it just drifting across the field compared to the thousand frames with the motor on. So the thousand frames of the motor on is on the left hand side and the thousand frames just drifting is on the right hand side. And you can see how much sharper it is. And that set me going on quite a lot of work to totally change my whole motor system and the way that it was mounted um, to reduce vibration. But there's a very simple way of testing your tracking system. Um, and that's just by looking at a star, naked eye, and just tapping the eyepiece. So if you look at a star, tap the eyepiece, focus the star, tap the eyepiece. Um, it should just swing around, swings around in a crazy way and then get smaller and smaller and then it will be stationary. However, if you've got vibration on your mount being transmitted to your optical system, you will see that as a sort of sawtooth on the, the locus of the star. It won't move in that sort of smooth, ropey lasso shape. There'll be this crinkle pattern all over it. Um, but as soon as you switch off your motor and try it, um, if, it, if, it if it improves, then that will affect your ability to um, 
resolve fine detail on planet. So simple test, um, but um, it might be very uh, revealing for you. And then this is an image of Saturn taken after I rebuilt the motor system, showing nice sharp uh, edge on rings. Atmospheric dispersion corrector, Ian's talked about this already. Um, a simple device, and it allows you to correct for prismatic effects in the atmosphere by applying an, an equal and opposite dispersion to that caused by the atmosphere by using these little levers that control prisms inside it. I've got a huge amount on my website that I'll give you the address to later about atmospheric dispersion correctors, um, more than you'd ever want to know um, on there. Um, but it does make a big difference. Um, and uh, here's the image. Um, so this is for a color camera. If you don't do anything at all, it looks horrendously, um, this horrendous dispersion, red fringe on one side and blue on the other. That's for Saturn at 16 degrees. You can line up those individual channels in auto stacker or Registax, and that helps a little bit, but you can still see a higher resolution on the left and the right than you can top and bottom. Use an atmospheric dispersion corrector, and it's lovely all round. So it does make a big difference if you've got a, a color camera, um, always use an ADC below about 45 degrees. And there's Saturn at just 16 degrees. So at 16 degrees altitude, you can see ink division at the end, at the edges of the rings there. Just, it was not so long ago that if the planet was below 35 degrees, you wouldn't bother. You know, oh, it's gonna be so awful. Dispersion, atmospheric dispersion, you know, the scene gonna be terrible. But now with atmospheric dispersion correctors, you can get an image like that at just 16 degrees altitude on, on Saturn. Um, check your quality sort before stacking. Um, as I said, if you're using auto stacker, play around with this noise robust level and move the slider and just check that you really are going from good at one end to bad at the other once you've hit the analyze button and just go through as you change the noise robust levels you'll find that there are some settings there. And in fact, the default at three, so if you, if you never change it, it will have come in at a value of three, actually is quite a poor value to choose. And usually that noise robust level needs to be five, six, seven, or eight. Um, ah, here's another one. So, um, I started off like this, I would always stack a thousand frames. So no matter how many frames I collected, I would always try and stack a thousand frames. But it doesn't make any sense. What matters is the total accumulated exposure time as far as the shot noise. It's much better to stack on a percentage because then it's independent of the gain and the exposure time. It's a much better handle. So what do I mean by that? So on the left hand side, we had this short exposure, high gain, 2,400 frames. On the right hand side, we just had 600 frames, but the total accumulated exposure time is the same in both cases. And the noise is the same in both cases. And we've got 30% in both cases. Much better, you know, you've got the same shot noise there and the same percentage, just use percentage rather than the number of frames. If I'd have chosen a thousand frames here to compare with a thousand frames here, the noise levels would be totally different. Much better to just choose a percentage. Keep the wavelets simple. So people agonize about what wavelengths, what wave uh, wavelet settings to use on this slider. Um, which I showed you boosts the contrast. I never play around with these lower sliders at all. All I do is 
move this top slider to 100% and I play around with the sharpen until it doesn't look over processed and then increase the denoise to get rid of the worst noise and I'm done. Occasionally I will tick this linked setting which automatically brings these lower ones in without actually moving the sliders. Just keep it simple. Keep it simple. You know, a lot of people agonize about, oh, I'll give this 100%, I'll give this 60%, I'll give this 30%, I'll give this... It's way too complicated. It takes way too, way too long. Just use that top slider and play around with the sharpen and the denoise and maybe the link. So top tip, uh, you often get very good seeing around sunset. So you might think, well, the sky's not really very dark, is it? So, you know, I shouldn't be imaging. Well, actually make the most of it and don't worry too much about the twilight. You can cancel that off. Um, but often the seeing is very good. And here's an example. So this was about 15 minutes after sunset, I think. And the seeing was absolutely superb. Um, some of the best seeing that I've ever experienced. Um, but when this, by the time the sky had become dark, it was just ordinary. Um, and often you find that, that as the sun sets, the winds die down and there's a sort of calmness descends. Um, make the most of that period. So have your scope cool down um, well beforehand. Um, you probably won't need to cool it as much because it's, you know, it hasn't got cold at that time, but everything sort of calms down around then and often cloud dissipates. So that's a, that's a good time to image. And then finally, use a color camera for color imaging. I know this is a bit controversial um, and some images resolutely stick with um, using color filters to end up with the color image. So they'll use, take a, a mono camera, take a video through a red image, a red filter, then a blue filter, then a green filter, and then combine those three processed image into one. So I used to do that. Um, and then color cameras became much better. And then, using them with ADCs, they were on a par with mono imaging. So I thought, well, not really, surely. Surely mono imaging has got to be better than color camera imaging. So I did a load of experimentation, which uh, an example is shown here. So on the, sorry. So on the right hand side is mono RGB and on the left hand side is the one shot color camera. I wouldn't like to pick one of those over the other. Um, you know, they're very similar in terms of the amount of detail seen. Um, but one of the big advantages of a one shot color camera is that once you've got, if you've got one color in the color in the bag, you've got all three colors in the bag. Whereas with the mono camera, you can easily have a good red, or a good green and then the blue's not so very not so good or the blue's good and the red's not so good you know or the cloud comes over when you're doing the blue and it's so much more complicated and the amount of processing is so much greater um color camera really simplifies things allows you to make the most of um you know nights when there might be cloud around you know you might have short breaks between the clouds, so much less frustrating. But I'd always held the idea that probably in very good conditions, um, mono cameras would win out for color imaging. So on that very good night um, that I just told you about, I decided to give it a go. There we are. So in very good conditions on the right hand side, we have a mono camera with color filters. And on the left hand side, we have the color camera without any color filters, much less processing. And to be honest, I prefer the one on the left hand side. And these aren't isolated. I haven't just picked the best examples. 
this happens time after time that the color camera um, matches the mono RGB imaging. And that goes against what all the convention. So people would say, no, that can't, that can't. It's always got to win out. If you're doing scientific images and you need narrower bands on the color, you know, for correct analysis, then you might do mono RGB imaging. But for general, just I want to produce a nice color image of the planets, just make your life easy. Go for a one shot color camera. Do use it with an atmospheric dispersion corrector and you will be um, more than uh, satisfied. A bit about software, just slide in there. We talked about fire capture. We, sorry, we didn't talk about fire capture. It's the best program around for driving your camera and will drive all the popular makes of uh, planetary imaging camera. It's free. The guy who develops it will come up with new features all the time. I've got a big section on my website that's well visited that um, helps you explain some of the features with fire capture. There's also sharp cap, but that's more sort of geared towards deep sky observing. Um, video processing, once you've got your videos, a program called PIP, which is like the Swiss army knife of video processing. Auto stacker, we talked about the stacking software. Registax I gave up a long time ago, it's so troublesome. And auto stacker is so much better. But uh, Registax do use that for wavelet processing. And then for further sharpening, I do use um, a program called Astra Image, which is a plugin that you can have in PaintShop Pro or Photoshop. And once you've combined things in WinDupos, you can then go on and push things a little bit further and sharpen things up a little bit more. And I use Astra Image for that. And I use Topaz Denoise to help with my noise reduction smoothing. So there we are. Uh, if you want to find out more and see um, my planetary images, you've seen some in the last two, in these two talks. Um, under digital video images. I've got all the different planet sections. I've got all sky camera uh, videos here. I've done hundreds of sketches of deep sky objects and planets under here. There's a huge amount about all the equipment I use um, with um, pages about the atmospheric dispersion corrector, and how you test telescopes and things like that. And then lots of interesting miscellaneous stuff under other stuff. Um, so be more than welcome to visit and have a browse through there. There's a, a lot of pages and a lot of work that's gone into that. And then if you want to, if you're on Twitter, or even if you, you don't have to be a member, you don't have to sign up to Twitter to see this, you can see this. Um, just going on your browser. All my latest images are, um, are put on Twitter uh, and I um, tweet those out uh, on a fairly, fairly regular basis, along with any other bits and pieces of interest that uh, I think people who follow me might be uh, keen to hear about. So uh, thank you very much. Sorry, I've gone on a bit longer. It's a lot to cram in there. And I could talk for another few hours or another few days about this subject, um, but uh, I'd be pleased to take any questions. Well, having if everybody follows through all the things you've said, we can have a whole new load of really good planetary images coming through. But I know that it, the devil is in the detail. You've really got to take care of every aspect, as you were saying there. And... Yes. Uh, just one thing you were saying earlier on about the telescope at the peak to midi and the difference, the fantastic difference that you showed between the images uh, taken actually after I was there, because I was there in the 70s, um, in fact, uh, 1970. And um, the, 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 the best bit images weren't anything like what they can do these days, as you say. But on one occasion, <coughs> we were invited to, uh, I was using a different telescope, but... Uh, there was a planetary expert called Camille Shell who had been observing for years 
and he called us into the dome and said the thing is really good tonight have a look and he looked looked through the eyepiece himself and he said magnifique and i looked through the eyepiece i just had about half a minute to look through and it was fantastic just as you showed and that really made it clear to me how poor film was that imaging and the image i saw actually i don't think was as good as that planetary image which you showed from the one meter telescope but nevertheless it was it was just a, a knockout you, you, i've never seen anything like it so do we have questions if you'd like to stop sharing your screen martin um we've got thanks from various people for for the day um i i think if you have got questions and maybe Martin will be able to answer them individually offline at some point. Uh, but it's been a, a very educational day and I'm sure we've all gained a huge amount. I certainly have. Anybody got any questions? Catherine. Go ahead. Um, you use a topaz denoise. Uh, how, how do you find it in practice? Yeah, very good, actually. Yeah, I, I often do most times I will do a Gaussian blur, a small Gaussian blur of half a pixel to soften things. And then I use the topaz denoise in combination with that. You, you, if you overuse it, uh, then when you go to the astro image deconvolution, it doesn't, it doesn't work so well. It all looks a bit artificial, but yeah, I, I think it's quite good as a, as a plugin uh, uh, to just to tickle the last bit. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Hi, uh, uh, Robin. Yeah. Um, just three quick things. Um, <laughs> there's a lovely program called Affinity Photo, which you can buy sometimes for thirty pounds. It may be up to fifty, full price, which does virtually everything that Photoshop does, and uh, is obviously far, far cheaper. And most of our astronomy group in Macclesfield have been buying that. That's one thing. Affinity Photo. The other thing is there's a free deconvolution. Um, program in what's called Images Plus that used to be expensive uh, but now is free and that's got a lovely deconvolution process in it for sharpening. I use it for lunar sharpening a lot and finally just to say I do have a website as well if you just search for um, Astronomy Digest Astronomy Digest I think there's about a hundred or so articles on all sorts of things not quite as clever I think as uh, Martin's but nevertheless there might be some things there that are useful. So anyway, thank you, Martin. I've learned an awful lot from you. And I'm going to, I've got a 12 inch um, Dal Kirkham, which I saw someone had actually been using in something oh, right. saying nice. earlier. And I think I'm going to have to get that. When, when Jupiter's up at 37 degrees elevation with yeah. my ADC, I shall be at it, at it next summer. Right. Thank you. Good. Okay, well, that more or less wraps up the day. And we've had some super talks ever since 10 o'clock. And um, I, I think it's gone pretty well. We've had, at the maximum, we had about 70 odd, <clears throat> I think I counted 77 between um, Zoom and YouTube. And uh, I hope to get the recordings onto YouTube in due course. Uh, so I'll send around a, a newsletter to tell members when they are up there, if there's something you missed or want to check back again, then hopefully there will be. I don't think I, I didn't record Ian's talk on my computer, but it will be on YouTube. YouTube. So we've had two, two chances there to get the recordings. And the thanks for coming in. Thank you, everybody. I was glad to see so many people here. It was a, it, it was a bit of an experiment to see what would happen. And there could have been just a handful of people, but we had some really good people, uh, some really good uh, talks and a great audience thank you very much and thank you all for behaving yourselves and not switching your microphone on and clinking your cups of tea <laughs> it, yeah. it helps a great deal so we we went through very well indeed and apart from the odd difficulty of sharing screen which is par for the course with zoom and uh, as i said to john morrell planet zoom is a mysterious world and you'd think by now they would have sorted it out, but odd things happen like that strange box that appeared on the screen, which none of us can get rid of. And there are whole pages of, of internet texts on how to do it, but uh, I think a bit of tweaking at the Zoom end would help. Okay. Yeah, but 
that was very good, Robbie. Yeah, it was a very good day you've organised here, and I, mean, I hope we're soon going to, you know, we're going to get back to um, physical meetings. I know you'd planned it for January, and now you say in the latest one it's going to be April, likely. But but even also, I mean, where I am, I'm lo- looking forward to hoping that we're going to get back to the um, to the Cambridge conventions. But if not, you did such a good job on this, Robin. You could perhaps do something like that <laughs> on well, there. And get, the- get you know, if the section directors did some, you know. YouTube videos for uh, for their bit, you know, you could probably all put that in with a talk like today. Yeah, well, this, this has been a good trailblazer day, so I think we'll we'll uh, take that message. And so, thank you to Martin and Ian, and also, of course, to Lee, and thank you to you for coming along. And with that, I shall end the meeting. Thank you very much indeed. Goodbye, everybody. Yeah, everybody. Yeah, thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.